else? Can I ask you something? Do you really like working on Kane stuff? You really like busting people? Yeah. I bust frauds, I bust furries. I love it. Have you ever busted anyone you know? Yeah, I tried it. That makes a difference. See, in my business, you soon find out that everybody's capable of anything. Think of it, they've done it. Yeah, but think of the other side. It doesn't even too much to be disappointed in either. What's up, y'all? What's up? Let's go. Time to start here. You might have to help me out with my audio because I got brand new audio here. I got brand new mic, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to wear the headphones for long. I hate wearing headphones, um, so 
Uh, you might have to tell me how the audio levels are. Tell me if it's good. Check, check, check. Tonight we're covering. I'm got to take these off. Tonight we're covering. <laughs> tonight we're covering um, three Thomas uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movies. Okay, this is the master class. Uh, it's not my master class. It's the ma- it's his master class in film, and I really my view is that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson uh, really represents a kind of. Uh, Neo Stanley Kubrick. I see a lot of parallels. Audio's a bit low, he says. All right, let's turn it up. Let's turn it up. Hold on. Let's turn it up. Let's turn it up. Here we go. Here we go. How about this? Is that a little bit better? Are we are we good now? Let's see here. All right, give me a second here. I'm working with the levels. I'm working with the levels. Let's turn it up. Should be good. Are we good? Let's see. There we go. Perfect, he says. You can hear me breathing. <laughs> you can hear me breathing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get it right, you guys, uh, but it's very, very compli- very, very complicated. Okay, let me turn it down just a wee bit. All right, all right, all right. I'm just going to leave it at that. So hopefully that's good. You know, I've been trying to work with the levels. I, shout, first of all, shouts out to our boy Grunt out there uh, because he has hooked us up with our audio and he hooked us up with our uh, with our brand new audio setup out here. You know the the dudes being dudes, fellas helping each other out. So I just got to get it perfect. But um, you know we're gonna do it live. We always do it live here. That's what uh, that's what Kristen says. That's what Slow Boy Whiteboard, Fast Boy Whiteboard says. We do it live. That's how we do it. So tonight we're covering again PTH, and uh, this is or <laughs> PTA, PTA, PSH, DDL, Tom Coom. We're covering three great films. And again, like I was saying, I sort of see this as a Neo Kubrick. I mean, because there's something thematically in terms of their films. That shouts out to Block Party out there. In terms of both of these guys, in terms of their films, their films have lots of space. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of distance. And I see some parallels in terms of, especially how they treat actors, how the actors work um, in their films. And, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson has stated that uh, it's really, it's he's just there when he's directing films to kind of make sure that they go smoothly and to be a guy who makes sure that the, who, who, who makes sure that the camera work goes correctly because all the direction he says is in the script. And you sort of see what that means as you watch or rewatch nine hours of, uh, of films. So, so we're covering, um, in terms of chronology, it would be There Will Be Blood, The Master, and then Magnolia. Um, I think that we're probably going to start with uh, Magnolia because it's the, it's the film that I watched most recently. And, um, and I think that the other two are kind of uh, – I mean, it's kind of a bookend. This and, and um, There Will Be Blood kind of form bookends for the 20th century. But um, – you know, the, the, these, the three films have so much in common. One of the things that they have in common is uh, that they all revolve around a magnetic, charismatic, strong um, central character, even though, the, even, though, even though they're really ensemble cast as far as the master goes, and as, especially as far as Magnolia goes. I mean, Magnolia is, a, is an ensemble piece. But they revolve around these three characters, and I'll say that, you know, Tom Coombs, um, Frank T.J. Mackey character is the main character uh, in in Magnolia. And as you read, uh, as, I, as you watch nine hours of these films and then read, uh, this is the stack of, look, this is the stack of analysis that I've got for this fu- for these three films. And I've sort of, there's so much to cover. I sort of considered whether I wanted to, break these up into three streams. We're just going to go ahead and make it into one because it's one, I see it as one sort of through line in terms of uh, um, an American trilogy. So um, <laughs> let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, shouts out, by the way, again, to um, to Grunt, who hooked me up with this uh, nice setup here, and we'll be working on that in the future. Also, before we start, you can see me on uh, Rachel, based homeschool mom's channel tomorrow night. We'll be covering breakup lyrics from women's music or female female singers uh, in terms of witchy breakup lyrics. So we're going to be covering all kinds of stuff. Uh, L7, Bikini Kill, 
Kate Bush, Fleetwood Mac, and whatever else comes up in terms of music. We'll be covering that. Also, we have some a lot of streams coming up. Um, I don't have my copy of uh, Island of Dr. Moreau with me right here, but um, I've asked uh, our homeboy JD to cover that with me, we'll, so we'll see when we can get to that. And also, I'll be doing a uh, mega stream on Peter Pan, first week of September with uh, Jamie. Um, and we've also got a bunch of sponsor streams coming up. You guys, I haven't forgotten about the sponsor streams. Uh, they are just, uh, they, they've, I've been doing a lot of work with these, and we've got to do Icelandic sagas. The Ben Franklin, the Decameron, the o Pioneers, O Pioneers, which um, somebody sponsored this week. I'll get to that in a minute. And um, which actually came up in Magnolia, which is, which is crazy. You know, you might say uh, Magnolia is, you can look at it in a, a number of different ways. I mean, one, I'll say that I watched the movie when it first came out um, in the 90s. It's an interesting movie because the movie is called Magnolia by Paul Thomas Anderson. It stars Jason Robards, Tom Coombe. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman is in it, Julianne Moore, John C. Riley. It's got a great cast. Uh, and the reason that he made this movie was because after the, the mega success of Boogie Nights, the studio basically gave him carte blanche and said, you know, do whatever pet project you want. So he made a three hour, three hour, eight minute film. And, uh, I've, I read in an interview that, uh, recently that he said that, you know, if, if he. Uh, were to do it again, then, of course, he would cut it down. I mean, there's a whole storyline with Orlando Jones that's been left on the cutting room floor, probably for a good uh, reason, because that leaves in more to do with, uh, to, to be gleaned from the kind of profit character in this, which is actually this little kid in the movie. And the movie is, has a lot of biblical significance in it. Um, one is that Exodus 8-2 is referenced like a bunch of times in the movie. There's so much symbolism. It's it's really hard to sort of uh, dissect and take apart. I mean, the 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 Masonic element is is huge in the movie. And I saw again. I saw the movie when it came out in 1999. The, the movie came out the same year, by the way, that Tom Coombe made uh, Eyes Wide Shut. It sort of uh, is a, a reversal of something that. Um, his character said in the movie Collateral, Michael Mann's uh, Collateral, a few years later, dealing with L.A., where he said that basically, remember in that in that film uh, where he plays an assassin, his character says that L.A. is so um, disconnected, right? It's so huge and so sprawling that it's disconnected and nobody knows each other. Everybody exists in this sort of, you know, on this plane of existence in L.A., and nobody's lives intersect. Well... That movie kind of um, turns that on its head. But as far as this movie goes, it's the opposite. It's that they live in this huge, sprawling place and that everybody's lives intersect and interconnect. And I see this um, as something uh, as we could, you know, obviously there's a like a Jungian element in the in the film. I'm not sure that that's what's being pushed, but I think it's more of a something that John C. Riley's character and uh, ties into with Exodus A2 and then also... Um, the way that the film ends, which is uh, truly a biblical ending of release. So Circle G uh, drops five bucks, the $5 super chat, and says, I had biblical studies professor, and we talked about movies. He liked to ask, what is the theology of uh, PTA? Excited for the stream. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I think that's a good question, and, uh, and I'm not sure what his explicit answer would be. Um, but uh, I think that um, his worldview is certainly pushed through in these three films, but they're so different. Um, again, There Will Be Blood is is a almost pure Nietzschean nihilistic film. This film is uh, a, in many ways, uh, has a, a biblical resonance about the modern world, a pre-Big Nine. And The Master is obviously a Scientological uh, film. So, Let's, again, start with Magnolia. So the movie is about uh, a bunch of disparate characters all existing in L.A. in the late 90s. And it's kind of a, it's disconnected and, and nonlinear. Uh, this is obviously, this was a big theme in the 90s in terms of film, you know, especially because this was, I think this was because of Quentin Tarantino. There's a lot of similarity between, between Tarantino and, and 
uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. I know that they're they're friends. Um, I know that they hang out and talk uh, movies all night. I re- I read about them doing that during the Karanka. Uh, but one thing that happens is, you know, we have so we're introduced to. I'll, I'll introduce the, a couple of the characters to you here. Um, there's the Wiz Kid. The Wiz Kid is a we're we're looking back in time, and the Wiz Kid is the child of uh, a single father. Single father is obviously supposed to be this kind of archetype, to, archetype of the uh, the celebrity parent that we see. So we see so many of these uh, who kind of sells his son around to these uh, various game shows and keeps the money. And uh, the whiz kid will see will go on a um, on a game show and will absolutely dominate. We see him at school, by the way, and. When he gets to school, he he empties out his book bags and he's got a number of books on the table. We're going to go over some of those and what they are and what the the symbolism is, what the significance is. He will intersect with the the host of the game show is who's a guy named Jimmy Gator, um, and he's played by Philip Baker Hall. And what happens what happens with his storyline? Uh, the Whiz Kid is basically that he um realizes while he's on the game show that he is a commodity for his dad and and for the people on the game show and they won't let him go to the bathroom while he's while he's on this thing um he's got these two these two uh partners that are kids on the game show who don't answer any questions but especially the fat kid um he's a real mouth to the older people uh you know they they uh they won't let him get up and he's totally dominating and um he he decides to fold uh, on purpose, Philip Baker Hall or Jimmy Gator is this longtime game show host, and that dude who's in Hard Eight, which is uh, um, Anderson's first film, which I-, I wanted to like. I, you know, I've tried to watch that movie a few times, and it does. It's great when Philip Seymour Hoffman is in the movie. Um, he's got that great scene at the cra- at the what is he at the craps table, um, but and John C. Riley is also in that. It's got a great opening shot. But um, he is a father who uh, decides, who realizes that he has cancer, and he goes in and he ta- he goes to find his daughter. His daughter is uh, at some other guy's apartment. He walks in and she won't see him. She's screaming at him. We're gonna realize what this means um, as we go on. Then we have John C. Riley. John C. Riley is the wholesome character in the movie. He's very likable. Um, he now he's a cop. And he starts off by getting a domestic disturbance call, and he goes into this uh, woman's apartment. She's screaming at him, um, and he's you know he's he's there solo, and he says you know I got a domestic disturbance call, and then he basically uh, ends up handcuffing her, and he goes into the back, and he finds a uh, dead body in a closet, and he says oh what is this? That will lead him on to uh, going outside to talking to this kid, this kid outside who let me know if my levels get a little hot. You guys, because um, I'm, I'm watching my monitor here. I'm not used to dealing with this, so, um, so let me know about the audio, Jethro. Let me know about the audio. Um, if it's doing well, if I need to turn it up, if I'm good. Uh, so, I'm try I'm trying to set it so that I, when I talk, I'm not I can talk like into the microphone and I can move away and it doesn't it doesn't go absolutely silent because everybody else has great mic and my and I just can't get it right. So I'm trying to get it right. Thanks, thanks, you guys. Uh, um, so he goes outside and talks to this, uh, this little kid who tells him, I know who did this. It was, and, and he, and he raps to him. John C. Riley won't listen to him. The kid even said this part was, a, this part got to me because the kid says to him, um, you're not listening. You're not listening to me. And, you know, he kind of blows him off in a sort of, you know, gruffish way. But the kid in his rap, it's a sort of a prophetic rap, and he tells him um, that it was the worm, and we're going to learn who the worm is. Uh, the worm is going to be end up being, I guess, the worm is going to end up being Jimmy Gator, um, and that's going to be a that name holds all all kinds of significance. I'm trying to give you a basic r- rundown of, of some of the characters in the plot here in the narrative. Um, then we're going to meet um, this guy Earl uh, Earl Partridge. And he is going to, he owns Partridge Productions that owns the game show. That's, he's played by Jason Robards. He, Jason Robards is in a nice, you know, L, modern L.A. house, and he's uh, lying there on his bed, and he's, he's dying. He's on his deathbed. He says it's a, 
you know, cliche, the old man dying on his deathbed. Philip Seymour Hoffman is named Phil Parma, and he's a nurse taking care of him. And then we are introduced to Julianne Moore. Julianne Moore is the wife, younger wife of this older man, Jason Robards. She has to go and uh, f- to go to her lawyer and then go to the doctor, fill out a morphine prescription for him because he's on his deathbed. We're going to learn her story. Um, and then we also get the best character in the movie, which is uh, Frank T.J. Mackey, who is Tom Cruise. Now, I just got to say right off the bat here that uh, watching this movie, this is a three-hour movie, and I got to say that there's a reason I didn't watch this movie for all these years. I watched it again last night. And it is a, to put it in terms of a cliche, uh, it is a roller coaster. It is a hard watch. It's a hard movie to watch. I think that this movie is probably the hardest movie to watch of Paul Tam- Thomas Anderson's movies. Um, because every, it runs the gamut of emotion. But not even that. Um, Tom Tom Coom is so good in this movie. He I can't I can't I'm just some dude watching movies, but I know about acting. Okay. And Tom Cruise is unbelievable in this movie. He is so good. I I I would even venture to say, hear me out now. I already I already we already we're fans of Tom Coom here. And I've already stated, you know, many times over that uh, I think that Tom Coombe is the great, greatest uh, Hollywood character. I mean, he he sort of exists to make movies and for entertainment. And I'm not talking about his personal life. I don't, you know, all that stuff. Um, but in terms of his movies and in terms of his dedication to movies, you cannot doubt it, right? Well, if you if you doubted Tom Coombe as an actor, you should watch this movie. Because I would say that this is one of the great performances of all time on film. Of all time. And there are a lot of great performances on film, but this one is unbelievable. He is so good. He is, he is, he's, I mean, he is really, I mean, he's really strong. He's one of the, this is one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in a movie. And Whatever about the Oscars and all that stuff. I mean, whether you know, it's all what it is. But if if it were what it if what it's supposed to be, he was robbed. He was robbed for not winning an Oscar for best supporting actor. You know, oftentimes uh, the Oscars, we can see that the best supporting actor in a film is often the like legendary performance. Uh, we see the great actors win a best supporting actor. You know, I mean, think Benicio del Toro in Traffic or any number of characters. He's so good in this movie. He's unbelievable. So first of all, he's playing a kind of um, uh, Andrew Tate character 20 years, you know, 20-something years ahead of time, right? He's, uh, but this is pre-internet, you know, this is, you know, AOL days. So he's uh, live, right? And he's hosting these sort of motivational um, speeches at men's meetings. And he's, uh, he's, uh, he's a, a, a men's club guy, we'll say. And he comes out and he's got this, um, you know, he's got this leather, leather vest on, this leather waistcoat. He's got, he's got his hair like sort of tied back. And he's got this like um, wrist, wristband thing. And he's got his, his, his earpiece in, right? And he comes out and he gives these speeches about how basically, um, you know, women uh, don't, don't trust women. And, you know, you're a man, you know, all, all the stuff that he says. But, there, and there's no, there's no, the, the thing about this is that there's no vulnerability in his performance. Um, his, his performance is straight up strength. It's all on the surface, uh, absolute, you know, there's, there's no, he doesn't falter at all. He, you believe exactly what he says, but you know, because of the, I guess the dramatic irony that he's going to end up being. There's, there's going to be something more to his character. Now, what we learn um, as we go on, yeah, he's got the kind of man bun, but that gives him a kind of a Hollywood flair, you know, and he's also in Burbank. He's in the Valley, San Fernando Valley. And uh, all of the characters are kind of, yes, Hirsch, it's a tour de force. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
It, no, but it really is. I mean, if anything ever was, then it was this, uh, truly. And we're going to learn that he's the, actually, Phil Parma, Philip Seymour Hoffman, is going to learn that he is the son of Earl Partridge. Now, what ends up happening is um, we're going to see that uh, Tom Coombe, TJ Mackey, is going to give uh, an interview to this uh, female reporter, and she's going to ask him about his history, and he's going to say the kind of thing that Jim Morrison says in said in real life, which was that his parents are dead. He says, well, he essentially says, he says his father died many years ago, and his mother, whom he was very close to, she says, well, what about your mother? And he says, oh, of course I was close to my mother. She's my mother. And, and the lady says, well, what, what does she say about your comments about women? And he says something like, well, she says, go get them. And, um, and he says that his mother is, uh, is, um, she's been sick for many years. Well, well, he's going to be confronted with the fact that this is, this is well into the film that actually his father is alive and that his mother is dead and he gets pissed. And actually what he does is he, he, he very he carefully, I'm not going to do like an acting breakdown in this, but he, we see his character completely shift in this scene. And it is very powerful because he's not saying anything but he looks in her eyes, uh, this reporter's eyes, and he doesn't say a word for for minutes. He doesn't say anything for a long time, and then finally at the end, she says, "What? So that's it? The, the time time's up, um, and the, the interview's over." And he says, "You you uh, requested me for this amount of time, so I gave you my time." And he you know he he says some words to her, and then she. He kind of lashes out at her, and she ends up pushing him. And then he walks out, and then he gets a phone call about his dad. His dad um, has this uh, will, and his dad is his dying wish is, to, I guess, to see his son again. And we we learn that when he goes, I'm skipping a lot, but when he goes back to the house, and he actually does go in to see his dad, and he hasn't seen him in many years, and he leans beside the bed, and he gives a scene. He gives a very powerful scene where he says that he's not going to cry, and he. Uh, totally totally breaks down and he says that he hates him he hates his he hates his dad he hates him because because his mother got sick and his father ran out and he never came back he never he never took care of them he never appeared again and it was left with his mother so then we learned that the reason you know we kind of assumed that the reason that he hates women is because of what is this Weird psychological, you know, not to break it down psychologically, but the weird psychological thing where he had put so much emphasis and so much into his mother that he sees that as a weakness, and so then he makes a career of that. But it's actually his father he has all the hatred for. And then he tells his father that he hates him, and then he says, please don't go, please don't leave me. Oh, my God, it's very, very powerful. It's a very powerful scene. And his father dies. We also, by the way... We get a um, extremely powerful. Uh, I've never seen Julianne Moore so good in a movie, and, and I'm not. I don't care about her as an actress. I, I really, I've always thought she was, you know, pretty overrated. I didn't like seeing her in all this in the spate of movies in the 2000s. I thought, whatever. I don't. I don't get anything from this actress. But this movie was different. Um, she was very good. Uh, and so, so it sort of begs the question: What is what does Anderson do? with these actors to get them to, to give these performances. And I think that a lot of that, a part of that is in the script. And one asks oneself, you know, about, I, I think that we've talked about Stanley Kubrick's, um, you know, attitude towards actors in film. Right. And, well, uh, you know, my view is that what, by the way, one of the only actors who never complained about Stanley Kubrick as a director was Tom Cruise. <laughs> Because he's a professional and he's there and he's there and he knows what it takes and he knows what he has to do and he's willing to give the time. The other actors, um, as I've discussed before, sort of see this as um, they 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 think that they are doing too much and they don't see the the grander scale. Now now Anderson talked about this when he said that actors will often come up to him and say that he wrote the best script that they've ever read, um, and then when they get later into the discussion. He'll say, they'll say, oh, well, I didn't read the entire script, which usually they don't. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, but, you know, Kubrick, 
is willing to uh, put his actors into intense situations and re and repetition in order to get from them the performance that he's looking for for the work of art as a whole because they're going to live forever on screen. So um, their their current um, the, their current you know uncomfortable notions be damned. Right? He doesn't care about that. Um, he kind of just has to break through it. Now, Paul Thomas Anderson is kind of different, uh, at least the way that I've I've seen, in that, you know, a lot of times also a actors will look for time to improvise, which I see as kind of a... It's, it's, that's fine for theater and, and even for some films, depending on the, the theme of the particular film. But, like, think about Quincy Jones and how he talked about uh, musicians. There's, an there's a great interview with Quincy Jones where he talks about, they're asking him, asking him about um, his work with uh, Michael Jackson. And they said, you know, how does Michael come up with um, these songs? And Quincy Jones says something like, I'm paraphrasing here, but Quincy Jones says something like, musicians, I, uh, singers have added, have, have, they have ideas? No, what are you talking about? No, 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 I'm a producer. So I produce the song. I don't give them any. I don't ask for their ideas. I don't ask them to do things in, to what they think, their opinions about things. They come in. I want my song a particular way, and I work them until they get it that way, which is interesting because most people don't consider that when thinking about you know the making of uh, music or especially pop music. You can see it in his making of um, with you know Thriller. Or even with uh, even with uh, James Ingram and, and Michael McDonald, yeah, I'm gonna be there. <laughs> Did you guys see Nick Mullins' uh, bit about Jurassic Park? By the way, I'm gonna do Jurassic Park coming up soon. I'm gonna I'm gonna read the book again and watch the film because I rewatched the film last weekend and it's unbelievable. There's so much I didn't catch. Um, even in, I've seen the movie like a hundred times. It was the first movie I ever went on a date in seventh grade. <laughs> um, and uh. There's so much I didn't catch about it. First of all, um, Attenborough is basically Attenborough is basically a a uh, what is he doing? What what is he? What what is this theme park? Can anybody go to this theme park? Who can go to this theme this theme park? Right? You're gonna make a theme park called Isla Island. That's from American Dad, but Isla Island. Off the coast of you know Costa Rica, and no one can go to it. How are you, how do you afford to go to the theme park? It's not it's not PKD. It's not Paramount's King's Dominion. Who can go to this thing? And there's a lot of stuff with uh, KIDS in the movie, right? Um, and anyway, and Nick Mullen said that said that Michael McDonald originally wrote the the uh, music for Jurassic Park because bring hey Mr. T Rex. Bring back the dinosaur for a cup of coffee a day. You could sponsor a child and a dinosaur, right? <laughs> you got to watch it. I'm I'm not doing it justice. Uh, how did I get into Jurassic Park? Um, yeah, so, so anyway, um, sorry for that tangent. My point is that there is a way for for producers, actors, directors to get their uh, uh, perform uh, producers and directors and writers to get the uh, the the performance that they need out of a, an actor, and somehow uh, Paul Thomas Anderson does that with this film. So what uh, what ends up happening is um, sort of long and uh, long and short of it is that uh, Wiz Kid grows up and he becomes. Um, William H. Macy. God, there's so many three three named names in these movies. Uh, William H. Macy, who has grown up to be a kind of loser nobody um, and who's stupid. He says that he's stupid. You know, this is like the smartest kid in the world uh, at the beginning of the film, and he's grown up stupid. And he spends his time complaining at a bar, and then he breaks into this uh, shop owned by a guy named, I think his name is Solomon Solomon. Um, and then what happens is there's a, there's a deus ex machina in the movie and it rains frogs. So there's a plague of frogs. It rains frogs at the end of the film. And I think this confuses a lot of people or it definitely confused people at the time, but this is, was seen as a, 
kind of surrealistic moment in the film, and it is surreal. But what I realized about the film is that the Exodus 8-2 verse and the Reigning of the Frogs provides a release. So the movie, what the movie is really about is a kind of uh, generational A-B-U-S-E. And you see that all of the kids in the movie or all of the kids who have grown up to be adults have been brutalized by either their parents or by adults in their in their life. And they're all existing in this sort of L.A. nothing scape where they're trying to make it in various ways. Frank T.J. Mackey obviously has his pain because of how his dad treated him when he was young. Whiz Kid is treated that way. The daughter of of uh, Jimmy Gator uh, is has been abused. And actually, he will later in the movie, he will say that his daughter, I don't want to say too much, but his he says that his daughter treats him the way that she did because she got this idea into her head that he something her. And then that's when the wife uh, confronts him and says, or his new wife says, did you? And he says, I don't know. And she says, you did, you did. And then she leaves him. At the end of the movie, you know, um, William H. Macy is climbing up this uh, telephone pole and he gets hit by in the head by a frog and he falls down and breaks his face. And he talks about, this is really heart-wrenching, he talks about how he has so much love to give but he doesn't know where to put it. That was really hardcore. Now, the movie actually begins with, a, it's a kind of a Masonic parable in a way, because the movie begins with this statement that chance is the guiding principle in life or is supposed to be in the film. But I did, actually didn't even see the movie as a variation of chance or some kind of manifestation of chance. I saw it as uh, the interconnectedness of life. The first thing they show is that there are there were three men who were hanged, um, which is a, a Masonic theme. They show these three hanged men. Then they show a um, a man get robbed in a store. Um, and what's the name of the? I forget the name of the of the street that the guy's on, but it's like Langtree Street. Langtree is another character in the movie, um, like Lily Langtree. But let's say it's Langtree Street. And the three guys who robbed and killed him were called Lang, Tree, and Street. And then, then there's another instance. There's three instances. There's a guy who jumps off a building to commit suicide. But as he's jumping off the building, it's all in black and white. He jumps off the building, and there's a woman who um, holds a gun, a shotgun at her, to her husband. She's going to kill her husband. She accidentally pulls the trigger, and the gun goes slightly aside, and it shoots through the window, and it shoots a hole through the guy's stomach as he's... So the guy jumped off the building, and as he's falling down, um, she shoots... A sh the la other lady in a different apartment shoots a shotgun through the window just by chance and blows a hole in his stomach, and the guy ends up dying because he would have survived, but the hole in his stomach made it so that he fell faster and then he died. And I think this is something they, they discuss in law schools as far as culpability or, you know, what's the origin of death. But what's interesting is that at the end of the film, this actually occurs because, uh, because yeah, it's easy to forget about the opening because it, it there's a book in it. It also occurs at the end of the film. They talk about it. But when Jimmy Gator goes to blow his brains out in the movie, a frog falls. You see, you see a God's eye view. You see it from above and you see the frog falling through the the uh, the, the ceiling light, um, and and it falls through the skylight. It falls through the window, and it falls in between the gun and and his temple, and the gun goes askew. And then so I guess he survives at the end of the movie. Um, but what is what this is telling you is that the that one also falls on William H. Macy's face. That it, what it's telling you is that, um, especially with John C. Riley's character, it's hard to parse all this together. There's so there's so much in it. But what it's telling you is that um they're all released. They're all they're all the, these people are all sort of free. They're free from the sins of the father at the end of the film. And the last thing we see is the daughter of Jimmy Gator who's now, by the way, 
in love, clearly in love with John C. Riley. John C. Riley goes to her house as well earlier in the film for a domestic disturbance. And he ends up seeing something in her, and then he goes, he kind of goes back and he says, you know, I know this is, and I'm not supposed to do this, but would you, you know, like, do you want to? And she's like, go to dinner. And he's like, yes. And she's like, six o'clock. And he's like, well, I get off at 10. So they, they're going to go out at 10. They go out. Now, one of the interesting things about John C. Riley as a character also is that there's a scene where he walks outside and he's in the rain. He constantly prays in the movie, if you notice that. He's always talking to God and he's praying when he's talking to himself. And there's a point where he's in the rain and he loses his gun. Um, he falls. Somebody's shooting at him and he, he falls and he falls down this kind of mudslide and he loses his gun and he's praying to God, please, please let me find this gun. Because he's aware that, um, first of all, you know, he could lose his job. Second of all, somebody could find the gun and, and he's imagining what they'll do with it. So at the end of the film, when he's sitting there, he, he's, he's driving his car and he sees William H. Macy. He's going back from his date. He sees William H. Macy on this telephone pole and he assumes it's a robbery. He, go, he turns around. He sees William H. Macy get hit by this frog and fall on the ground. Then he gets out of the car and he saves him like he's in a war. He gets him out of, uh, out of the open air. He's talking to him. He's, li he's actually listening to him, which is the opposite of what he does with the kid earlier in the film. And um, the guy's talking to him about, you know, uh, uh, about his, his trouble. And he, he then goes with him back into the store and he returns. He, he's on his right shoulder as William H. Macy opens the safe and returns all the money that he's stolen from Solomon Solomon, this employer who fired him. And in that scene, he's really, I, he's like a guardian angel, right? Because he's on his right shoulder and he says, he even gives this monologue about, he says, I believe there's a time for, to listen to people. There's a time for grace and there's a time of forgiveness. And there's also a time that people need to go to jail. But it's going to be a hard decision and a hard time for me to decide when those times are. But that's what his life is. And, and he watches over him as this guy who couldn't get really any lower except if he goes to jail. He watches over him and he makes sure that he doesn't, which is crazy. Then he goes back outside and he's sitting there. And that's when William H. Macy gives the, the monologue about he has so much love to give. And then guess what falls out of the sky? His gun. So his gun, Deus Ex Machina, his gun falls from the sky. And there it is. And he gets his resolution. And then at the end of the movie, um, the, the daughter who is now with John C. Riley smiles. That's the last scene in the film is her smile. So it's a crazy movie because there's so, there's so much, it really rips you apart. It rips you up. And there's so much heartache in the movie. I mean, it's very difficult to watch. Um, one thing that kind of annoyed me was that it's another one of those movies where the music plays throughout the movie, but I realized that there are a few different reasons why it's doing that. I, I usually, I find that cheap. I find that um, to be that the music is overriding the script and the narrative to tell you what to feel because it's this tension, it's tension music. But I feel like it works in this because there's a kind of tension that is common amongst all the characters and we get a view into it. So we hear the same music for all of the characters. And also that the tension is real in the movie. I mean, it's not usually in movies like that. The, the tension is kind of fake. In, uh, in other words, the tension in the scenes in a movie typically are not strong enough to do without the music. Th these were strong enough without the music, but the music just simply sort of, it's like the, 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 the strings are being, you know, tightened on you as you're watching it. Um, it's very interesting. Um, also, there is a heavy, heavy uh, sort of Masonic um, element to this movie. So for one, when, uh, why is it called Magnolia? So um, a few different reasons. I mean, when I think Magnolia, I think, of course, I think Mississippi. I think Mississippi down there, right, because the Magnolia is the state flower, state tree. Um, but, it, but a Magnolia is a kind of multifoliate, blossom right with different you know a bunch of different petals surrounding a core uh bloom so we see the different stories all connected right it's this flower they're all connected they're also blossoming 
you know, their their life goes and the and 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 it opens up, and we we're going to see that they sort of bloom at the end of the movie. Um, also, I I looked it up I, because of the Masonic thing. I looked it up. Is there a is there something about magnolias in Freemasonry? And there is a Magnolia Lodge in Burbank, which I found interesting. Um, and what was the other thing? Um, the kid, the whiz kid, is when you look at the scene where he's on the game show, uh, he's beh- and behind him is a caduceus. Um, and to up to his like upper left is a uh, square and compass. And then Jimmy Gator, when he's about to go on the, on stage uh, filming the television show, his producer puts his hand, his left hand on his right shoulder, and he's got a square and compass ring on his ring fi- on his little finger. And he says, um, there's a line that he says. He says, he says, uh, we met upon the level and we're parting on the square, which is pure uh, Freemasonry, right? So I found something here that I'm just going to read. And um, this is from, this is from so, I think this is from someone's blog. And I you, ordinarily I wouldn't, you know, I read this here, but I think it's pretty interesting and I think it holds true. So this, this is from something called Thoughts Out of Season. Um, the hitchhiker stu- stood by the side of the road and leveled his thumb in the calm calculus of reason. Maybe he got that from Jim Morrison. Right, it's from Highway, Jim Morrison. I don't know, but thoughts out of season. He says P.T. Anderson's Magnolia is not a simple movie, not by a long shot. Uh, who's the author of this? I like to give credit to the author. I don't think it has the author's name in it. Yeah, there's no author's name here. Um, but it's from Thoughts Out of Season, Magnolia. Four references for Freemasonry. Um, it is filled with symbolism, allegory, and a complex web of interconnecting interconnecting lives and happenings. The film alludes to several biblical passages and events, including Exodus 8.2 and Exodus 20.5. Exodus 8.2 is mentioned like, it's it's even on a sign. Somebody's holding a sign in the game show scene that says uh, Exodus 8.2, if you, if you caught that. The film alludes, uh, yeah, but one of the more p- uh, peculiar and stranger references made in the film um, are those two that allude to Freemasonry. There are three distinct instances and one slightly more debatable instance. Okay. So the first notable instance is when Stanley Spector, the boy genius, is studying in the school library. He has an array of books before him, many of which are meteorological. And and that's interesting because he's reading books on changing the weather. So at that point in the film, I was kind of thinking, is this boy going to change the weather? Is he going to will the weather to change at the end of the movie with the frogs? Is this some sort of, is he, is this some sort of wizard? You know, is this some sort of MK Ultra heart machine? What What's happening here, right? Well, um, one is uh, Wild Talents by Charles Fort. He says, yes, the Charles Fort, researcher of strange phenomena and author of the Book of the Damned. But the book that is of interest here is Albert Mackey's The History of Freemasonry. Um, also, it's interesting that he's at, that it, the book is by Albert Mackey and that Tom Coombs' character is Frank T.J. Mackey. It is most probable that Stan brought this book from uh, home as it seems to be an unlikely text to find in a middle school library. Uh, I wrote that, yeah, uh, T.J. Mackey is his character's name. Um, I found this interesting because <coughs> this ties into something else I'm working on, which is um, this pan uh, uh, analysis that I'm going to be doing with Jamie. And one thing I've been, just a little sidetrack here, one of the things I've been reading about is um, – Ted Hughes, I've mentioned this before, but Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath and how they were interested in the occult and, and esoteric. In Sylvia, I first came up on this because in Sylvia Plath's diaries, she talked about, I'll talk about this again in the stream when I'm with her, but but um, in Sylvia Plath's diaries a long time ago, I read, I've got it in the other room, but I read that um, there one time they were in Cumbria and they were sitting on a hillside, and they had been working with a Ouija board, and that they had contacted this entity named Pan. And also think of the Sylvia Plath line in Daddy where she talks about the cleft, not a cleft chin, but a cleft foot, right? So she's referring to Otto Plath, her dad. And so she, so she said, Ted Hughes, remember Ted Hughes, who was the poet, poet laureate later, 
and he wrote birthday letters, 1998. He was the poet laureate, 1984. He uh, wrote the, the poem Rain Char Charm for the Duchy for uh, um, Prince Harry in 1984. Anyway, he, um, he turned to her, and his eyes were totally black. We've seen that. We know what that means. And he strangled her. And she thought she was going to die, and then all of a sudden he let up and turned around and then she sat up and she didn't know what had happened. And he turned to her a second later and then started talking to her as if nothing, nothing had happened. And she realized that he must have been possessed by this pan. Um, and I learned that, that Ted Hughes's magical name was Pike. And he chose it for, of course, the Pike, the fish, because Ted Hughes's son, Nicholas, ended up being a naturalist um, specializing in fish. He later killed himself in, in America, just like within the last 20 years. Um, and that, yeah, and Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath were married. Of course, you know, she, she killed herself. And then again, he was, he married Asio Weevil, who was an Israeli poet and who also killed herself and their child. Um, and then his son killed himself. Frida Hughes, I think his, his daughter is still alive. She's a poet. I've got her books in the other room. But of course that you can't help but think of Albert Pike, right? Um, and I forget what her magical name was, but, um, my point is that it's interesting that Mackie and Pike both occur as books relating to, you know, as, th as Freemasonic elements relating to poets, writers, and movies, like in the span of like two days, uh, that I read these two things. That was crazy. Um, and this says, um, this says, the Masonic Square encompasses on Bert's ring. Bert is the producer, puts his hand on Frank, on uh, Jimmy Gator's shoulder, and he says, "We met up on the level, and we're partying on the square." Squaring the circle, you know, is a is a Masonic uh, phrase. So the next instance has two Masonic references together. Television Kids show host Jimmy Gator is dying of cancer, and he goes out to host the first show since he found out he has cancer. And his friend and the show's executive, Bert Ramsey, pl uh, places his hand upon Jimmy's shoulder and says, we met upon the level and we're partying on the square, to which Jimmy says, in my fucking sleep, Bert. On Bert's little finger is a gold ring with a Masonic square and compass. The phrase, we met upon the level and we're partying on the square, comes from Freemasonry. At the, at the closing of every Blue Lodge, the first, second, and third degrees, the following is said. The worshipful master says, Brother, Senior Warden, how should Masons meet? Senior Warden says, upon the level. Worshipful Master, how act, Brother, Junior Warden? Junior Warden, by the plum, Worshipful Master, and part upon the square, so my brethren, brethren, may we ever meet, act, and part in the name of the Lord. Clearly, this is Bert's farewell to Jimmy. Now, I guess Bert, his character Bert here is named after um, probably Bert Reynolds, honestly, because I know that he wanted... Burt Reynolds to be in this movie. Remember, Burt Reynolds got his Oscar nomination for being in Boogie Nights, but I think he refused to be in this movie because they got in a fight somewhere along the promotional tour. Um, he also asked George C. Scott to play the role of Partridge first, but um, he said it was the worst uh, writing he'd ever read, so Jason Robards took it, and then Jason Robards said later that it was, for better or worse, probably his best film performance. It's interesting because George C. Scott and Jason Robards both have their start at Barter Theater in Northern Virginia. Um, and I'm just throwing that. I, not that it means anything for this, but it's interesting because they're kind of cut from the same cloth. Um, and Jason Robards is a great actor. He was in, a, his greatest role probably, I think, is Long Day's Journey in the Night, um, the Eugene O'Neill uh, play, the film version of that. He's great in that. Um, and another thing here is that we have the game show. We have the game show element. So, so look, one if you if you're watching this movie now, this what you would have missed this when you're like 19 watching the movie in 1999. But because of course you wouldn't know about it then either because the stuff you know hadn't been uh, hadn't been brought out into the light into the public yet. But if you're watching this now and you see a game show host, it's a kids show. Um, we see two or three characters, four characters, intertwined with the game show who are all, not clearly, but it's alluded to strongly 
that there's something creeper going on here. And the name of the game show host is Jimmy Gator. One can't help but think Jimmy uh, Seville, as Norm MacDonald calls him. This It must be an allusion to this. He must have known. Surely he must have known about this. Right? Seville. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say his name correctly because fuck that guy. But, um, but also... Gator, Gator makes me think of like lizard person. I mean, isn't that isn't that wouldn't that be why he called him that? Yeah, J- yes, that thing, yes. So, and it, it's just very strange. I mean, Partridge, I guess, because this is just a is this just referencing Partridge Family, like the, you know, g- game shows and and kids shows of when he was when uh, Anderson was a kid, and when the story is set, you know. So I, I suppose that's what it's supposed to be. Or that he's a partridge, he's like partridge in a pear tree, he's roosting, roosting over the this all of these, you know, cons- consistent abuses, I suppose. So, also the plum here, the square, the circle, and the plum. Well, plum, you know, the plum is the lead weight, right? So you plumb the depths. Uh, the, the. I don't know anything about the periodic table, but I but I do know besides argon and xenon, those are the only ones that I knew when I was in school because I thought they sounded cool. But pl- I know that you know um, lead is PB because it's from the uh, Latin plumbum, right? And so that's because the lead weight was used to measure the depths of the aqueducts and the water tanks in Rome, right? So lead weight. So so that's the Masonic L. Um, tool in this because a man they're saying that a man is supposed to walk upright because it has to be upright for for the plum to work for the lead weight to work but that also is weird because it implies um that it's upright but it's at the depths doesn't it that you're plumbing the depths that there's something at the bottom there's something at the bottom of the mind and of the activities that's that's doing this wouldn't that imply that? I see that as a sort of a a, a double reference or a hidden reference. Um, Jason says a plum is also a reference to a Masonic vertical level. Yes. Um, uh, so this says, let's see, the level square and pl- and plum are the three tools of a fellow craft second degree. They have their sorry I. Re- I've written all over it. Um, they have their functional purposes um, for operative stonemasons, but to speculative masons, they have symbolic meanings. These meanings are given to the newly made fellow craft as such. The plum admonishes us to walk uprightly in our several stations before God and men, squaring our actions by the square of virtue and remembering that we are traveling upon the level of time to that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. Now that's a reference to Hamlet Act 3, um, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's noble or the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, right, or take arms. Uh, the undiscovered, that undiscovered country, which is relating to death, right? Go back and watch my Hamlet analysis. I'm not going to do it here, but um, I've done a whole Hamlet analysis. So the two Masons meet on equal terms and that no Mason is better than another. Mason in the square symbolizes that Masons should square their actions or write their actions. The fourth instance is more subtle as well as questionable in this author's mind, um, but it's worth presenting it anyway. Among the icons on the square panels behind the contestants on the show that Jimmy Gator hosts, what do ki- the show is called What Do Kids Know, is a set of compasses placed over two olive or laurel branches. Other emblems on the panels are from light, right to left, top to bottom, the tragedy and comedy masks, the Greek letter pi, uh, compass and laurel branches, Balancing scales, a globe, a paintbrush, and a palette. Now, these are, you know, these could be symbols of the liberal arts for the questions, for the trivia questions they're asking them. But it is interesting because, especially in terms of film, when you see images like this, obviously the symbolism is supposed to be, it's supposed to, it's, it's intentional symbolism. Bohr's atomic structure, the caduceus, a weather vane with the cardinal directions, uh, a hand holding a quill, a harp, and a book with an oil lamp. 
liberal arts symbolism, but in this instance, something different. Context in this case is a little help. It says, aside from these Masonic references conferring around the television show, as the other emblems do lend much to the Masonic theme, um, save maybe the seven, yeah, here we go, the seven, seven liberal arts, which are emphasized in the fellow craft degree, but then again, emblems of the seven, seven liberal arts are appropriate to the, to the trivia television show, trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, the first three part, parts of the seven li liberal arts. Compasses over a laurel branch is not a Masonic emblem, though it can very easily be inter interpreted as one because it, like, it looks like a square and compass. The curve of the two branches resemble, in some regards, um, the emblem of a past master, which has an arc under the compasses, the laurel or olive branch, both of which are borrowed from the iconography of the ancient Greeks and Roman Empire to note peace and unity, hence the use of the olive branches and on NATO's logo, the olive branch held by the eagle on the back of the $1 bill, etc. Peace and harmony and unity all being virtues exalted by Freemasons. There is perhaps, I'm just reading this. This is, I thought this was really good, so I might as well read it because, you know, um, again, it's called, uh, I want to give this person credit if you want to go to this uh, website. Uh, you can just Google Thoughts Out of Season, Magnolia, four references to Freemasonry. There is perhaps one other reference to Freemasonry in the opening stories, particularly the first story of the hanging of the three men. A gentleman and a businessman is um, murdered by three men who are trying to rob him. This is obviously Hiram Abiff, uh, relating to Hiram Abiff. This can be argued to be a reference to the Masonic legend of Hiram Abiff. There you go. Grandmaster and architect of King Solomon's Temple. While his legend borrows a little from the Bible, it is a strictly Masonic invention, who is murdered by three fellow crafts known as three ruffians who wish to extort the references of a mas uh, master mason from him. Perhaps this reference is coincidental, or perhaps it is actually derived from the Hiramic legend. Uh, exactly why these three references to Freemasonry are found in Magnolia is somewhat perplexing and has no simple answer. Nothing else in the film is remotely Masonic. Um, well, I think that um, one thing is it serves as a as a tool, a tool, of course, for the craft, a tool as in the method through which these characters are moving on a plane, right? We talked about the square, the compass, and the plane. So it, in a way, it functions as a kind of Masonic uh, parable, doesn't it? Or allegory, because the characters move on two planes of existence. There's one in the past, and there's one in the future, and then there's a third, which is going to be the future that's um, sort of... Uh, you know, we can we we intuitively read into that uh, at the end of the film with the smile. Um, also, there's more here. Um, questions about is is P. T. Anderson a, a Mason? I mean, I I don't know. Um, but certainly the Masonic elements are in this. He doesn't have to be a Mason in order to put the elements into the artwork, obviously, because we're talking about him here. And we're not so. Um, but this other this other thing I got, um, which has a which has a hashtag esoteric Hollywood, of course. But this isn't Jay. This is uh, this is some other blog that I found somewhere. Um, Magnolia's Hiram Abiff reference. While many have noted the Masonic influences in P.T. Anderson's masterpiece, one more reference to Freemasonry exists in the cold opening first story of the Hanging of the Three Men. Um, we just kind of read that already. Also, remember that he steals from a character named Solomon. Solomon, Solomon. Um, the quote at the end of the, at the beginning of the film, which he also ends with is, um, and I would like to think this was only a matter of chance, and it is in the humble opinion of this narrator that this is not just something that happened. This cannot be one of those things. This please cannot be that. And for what I would like to say, I can't. This was not just a matter of chance. Of These strange things happen all the time. So, in other words, the movie is often seen as a statement of chance or fate, but in actuality, it's not. Um, it's the, interconnected, the interconnectedness of these three, of, of there's, there's the three allegories that happen at the beginning, or the three scenes, and then... Um, how we have all of these interconnecting lines in the valley. Of course, it's in the valley, in the valley of the shadow of death. It's in the valley where 
in the Valley of the Shadow of Death, we have various characters who are dying or close to dying or going to commit suicide. Um, but in the end, um, you know, the characters are saved. And, of course, we get the John C. Riley character, who is the good character in this movie. So, so in other words, it's a, this is a tough movie. It's a, it's a tough movie to, um, to take apart. I think it deserves a lot more time than this. I mean, one hour that we've covered on it can't really cover it. I, I, I hope we've done something in terms of parsing out the symbolism in the movie. There's so much. I mean, look, even um, who was it who somebody sponsored the stream this week? Um, let's see. Um, I want to give a shout out to this person because they sponsored the stream. Um, and that was, uh, I don't want to say their name. I know they have a different name. I'll just say DW. Uh, DW sponsored a stream uh, earlier this week, 50 bucks on uh, Pioneers of Pioneers. Now, I, I was thinking that was the Walt Whitman poem. <laughs> but, um, but the... That poem was actually uh, brought up um, in terms of the, come on now, was brought up as one of the, qu the quiz, this is crazy this happened. Um, that was brought up as one of the quiz questions on the kids show in the movie Magnolia. And Pioneers of Pioneers is a poem in Leaves of Grass. But there's also a novel. Who wrote the novel? Um, the novel takes its name, obviously, from... Is it Willa Cather? It's Willa Cather. So I don't know if DW wanted me to do the Willa Cather novel or the poem. I'll do the poem. I think they wanted the poem. But um, but the Willa Cather book was brought up in the on the quiz show. I thought that was really weird. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Isn't that strange how... Real life mirrors art, right? In terms of uh, the, in, the sort of interconnectedness. Okay, so now I'm going to move on here. I think I'm going to cover next. I'm going to cover um, the master. And before I do that, can everybody please make sure that you have uh, that you have sponsored uh, sponsored that you have smashed that like. Please share the stream. Please sp um, smash that like. Uh, and if you want a super chat, if you want your comment to be read on air or you want me to give you a shout out or you want any you have a question ask me questions uh please give me a um a super chat there you can do that through youtube you can also click the links you can um super chat through any of the links in the video description or in the channel description you can also uh drop a super chat here through paypal or cash app or venmo wherever you like and I especially want to give a couple of shout out, shouts out here to some of my close people. Um, shouts out to DW again, who dropped 50 bucks um, two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago, for uh, asking me to do, uh, just basically saying thank you. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, shouts out to, uh, yo, shouts out to Matt, Matthew. This is the third Matthew. This is not Maddie. This is not Maddie, but this is Matt, who dropped thirty-five bucks for me yesterday and said um, that uh, his little group of Ortho Bros discussed my videos after liturgy during coffee hour last week. They finally did Macbeth. His brothers watched every one of my videos. Much love. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that, Matt. Uh, that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Yo, know, shouts out to my homeboy out there, the real John Connor. Real John Connor drops twenty bucks and says. For a vanilla shake, for a vanilla shake, with a side of bo, bo, what of Bodine, <laughs> I drink your milkshake. Thank you so much, John Connor. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up, and it goes all the way, all the way down, and it goes all the way down, and then I. Drink your milkshake. I drink it up. <laughs> Shouts out to John Connor for that 20 bucks. Thank you so much. Shouts out to Ryan out there who drops uh, $2.33. Ooh. It's kind of a backwards 322, sort of. <laughs> Shouts out to Ryan who says, 
for not entirely related, but any thoughts on? Oh wait, oh no, that was oh that was a long time ago. Okay, yeah, yeah. Shouts out to Ryan anyway for that. Uh, yeah, I read that one because I didn't know who the who the author was. Yeah, yeah. Shouts out to him. Thank you so much. And let's see, big big shout out to my very good friend, um, Maddie Maddie G, who uh, sent me a, a big old fat super chat this week. Big old fat super chat, fat super chat, big, big. Uh, thank you for, for uh, dropping that fat super chat. Maddie G, I love you. Thank you so much for doing that. Really appreciate you. I'll cover whatever you want me to cover. Um, shouts out to Andrea who drops. Andrea, is it Andrea or Andrea? I feel like if my name was, if I feel like if your name, I'll say, I feel like if your name is Andrea, you would get annoyed if somebody says Andrea and vice versa. So if you're out there, um, Andrea, please tell me how to say your name because I don't want to say it incorrectly. So Andrea drops 922. Dang. And uh, thank you so much, Andrea. Shouts out to Adam who drops um, uh, 706. Thank you so much. And it's probably eight bucks. And shouts out, of course, to our homeboy Jason out there who drops eight bucks. Really appreciate you out there. Um, yeah, again, shouts out to Maddie G. And I think we gave a shout out to Kevin last time. Shouts out to Kevin who dropped big old fat super chat um, for big, big money out there. Thank you so much. And also to Alicia who dropped 20 bucks. And um, also, before I forget, I want to thank people can get annoyed when I thank people, but I don't care because I'm going to thank them. Thank you uh, to Rooks G who does our awesome music. You know, he does music that he allows us to use. So thank you to Rooks G um, because he just dropped a brand new single. Please go over, go over to uh, ROXG Rooks G over at YouTube. And also thank you to, again, to Grunt, Grunt Smash, who's been on my channel. He did our, um, he did our jarhead analysis and he helped me out with this uh, audio equipment, this vocaster. Thank you so much. And shouts out to Hesher out there and the whole boiler room crew. Uh, you know, our hearts are out there with them because, um, you know, I would like to, I'd like to dedicate this stream to um, Chopper out there. Okay. So Chopper, um, if you guys didn't know this, I hate to be the one to, to break this, but, you know, uh, I think it's um, in his memory that we'll do this. So shouts out to Chopper, who uh, I was a guest on, you know, with on Boiler Room. He was a, a longer term, you know, he was a good friend of the Boiler Room crew, great friend of theirs. And I um, only had the opportunity to meet him and talk to him just a couple of times. But I heard him talk on Boiler Room for uh, a few years now, and uh, he was always a um, very entertaining and funny and a great guy, and, you know. And um, I know his friends miss him very dearly. So uh, shouts out to Chopper. Pray for Chopper. And this is dedicated to Chopper because we lost him uh, last week. Um, so, uh, pray for his, uh, memory, um, pray for his, uh, pray for his eternal rest. Uh, may he rest in peace. Shouts out to you, Chopper out there. This is dedicated to you and shouts out to the Boiler Room crew. Also, um, also to IPAC Arts, who does our artwork out there. I-P-A-K, IPAC Arts. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip the Magnolia Explained in 10 shots. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, yes, I guess next I will talk about the master because um, I watched this uh, also fairly recently, and I've seen it before. But the master is um, what, about ten years old now, and this is a great film because um, yeah, I'll get to there will be blood. I'll get to there will be blood last. I feel like people probably know that the most, um, and. On the master here. Uh, let's see. So, um, God, I got so much in here. Okay. All right. I'm not going to be able to find that. So, I'm just going to do this off the top of the dome here. All right. Shouts out to uh, Pure Blood Anglo Christian who drops five bucks. He says, I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you too. All right. So the master is about 10 years old. 
This film is is interesting because I saw this when it when it came out, of course, and I hated it. Um, I did not like the film, and the reason that I did not like it was because I thought that, <laughs> ironically, I thought it drifted too much. I thought the film drifted. It was too drifty. And what I realized now, uh, re-watching it, is that there are elements in it which I did not appreciate at the time. And also, you know, especially dealing with um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, this is uh, probably Philip Seymour Hoffman's great, great film. I mean, his his great film is uh, the one where he ironically plays a child, a former child star, right, in the Ben Stiller movie, where he's in a comedic role. And um, I got to see Philip Seymour Hoffman. He was the artistic director at the Joe Papps Public Theater in New York. Um, so I saw him there one time. And uh, he died in uh, 2014. But this is uh, one of his you know, last great films. This is a great film. Also, another film where a guy was robbed you know, of an award. Um, and so what the film is about is basically it begins with we see a character named, uh, well, it's Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, Joaquin Phoenix is so good in this. He kind of, in a way, gets lost in the background in terms of the actors, but he's a great, he's a great actor in this. Um, and one of the things that he does is, we, his name is, um, uh, Quell, what's his name? Um, Quell in the film. And he's a drifter. And basically we see at the start that he is uh, on a ship. This is World War II, and that he's on the beaches of Guam, uh, after VJ Day, and he is uh, drinking. He's he's you know he's he's drinking out of a coconut, and he's he's sort of making drinks. Then we see that the characters, uh, this it is uncomfortable to watch. Yeah, we see that the other sailors make a, you know, a sand. They make a sand woman, um, because they're sailors, and that Joaquin Phoenix goes up and he kind of violates the sand woman on the beach. And it's funny at first, and then it becomes very uncomfortable. And then we see him doing all kinds of creepy stuff on the beach. We see him back on the ship, and uh, we see that he is um, he's adept at moonshining. He um, he takes the one of the seals off of a torpedo, and he takes the ethanol out of the torpedo. I suppose the ethanol is what you know drives the engine in the torpedo, and then he filters it and drinks it. Now, this is going to occur later. He's moonshining. He does that. He does it here. He also um, will do it later on when he is a migrant worker, um, and he's like cutting up cabbages on a on a farm somewhere. And then he makes he makes you know he distills liquor that way. And then one of the old guys will will go essentially go blind, and that's where you get the phrase "blind drunk," right? Because oftentimes the ethanol is mixed in with methanol, and then it's not filtered properly, and then the person will go blind because of it. Um, but we see that Joaquin Phoenix's character is this drunken drifter. After the war, you know, he goes back home. He meets with a some kind of a war department psychologist. And they're going to ask him, they're going to give him a, a series of Rorschach tests, which they'll later, um, was that in this film? Later on, they're going to ask him what, the, oh, no, no, that was in a scanner. It's funny because I watched a scanner darkly recently also. Uh, which I'll be covering with Matt um, with uh, um, uh, Digital Minefield, Real Cooter Brown on his channel, uh, where uh, they they present a, a series of images and they say it's not a Rorschach test. It's funny because I watched those movies the same day, but um, you know, and they say, "What do you think this is?" And he says, "You know, it's a it's a woman's." You know, and he he, he gives the parts. It's basically the guy's a perv, and then um, he's going to end up as a photographer. He ends up in a this is. We see, this is great because th this movie is different than Magnolia because it's not really dialogue driven. It's spatially driven. It's all spaces and distances. And we see this recurring image of the wake of the ship in the water. And what that's supposed to be is obviously, well, it's not obvious, but the way that your actions result in, they result in other actions and that, you know, you leave a wake in your trail. And also, whether the character himself is awakened, right, because he's going to meet this guy, Lancaster Dodd, who is uh, is obviously supposed to be Hubbard. But, um, okay, but, but we see lots of sky and distance and space and silence. 
and it it there's a, there's a lot of emptiness in the film, which is supposed to be an outer symbol of his inner emptiness. So Joaquin Phoenix will go to, uh, he'll be back in America, and if anybody ever got the 1950s on film, oh my gosh, um, PTA really nails it. I mean, there's one particular scene where um, he's a, Joaquin Phoenix is a photographer like in a mall, and I imagine I imagine it as like Tallheimer's Mall in Richmond, Virginia, which is a mall in the 50s. And uh, he's taking pictures of various people, and there's a scene where he's taking pictures, a picture of these three boys, and the the film, the aesthetic quality of the film is so beautiful, it's so vibrant, and there's a lot of blue in this movie, by the way, and it's obviously supposed to be a Scientological blue. You know, all the 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 roofs are painted blue in Clearwater, Florida. That's a that's a color of Scientology, and there's a lot of naval a lot of naval and water imagery because again um the the captain or the admiral the admiral right uh hubbard who's the becomes the you know he's the master so in the film so he's taking pictures of these boys and then we see that he's in the film lab and again he's um he's making these concoctions of of various drinks and uh he makes some moonshine and then there's one scene Joaquin Phoenix by the way he has this thing uh, he has this body this body language where he he basically like he always has his hands backwards on his hips like this and he kind of bends over like this and you wonder why he's like that in the film and then you you realize it's because this guy is a creature i i think that probably he exists in the same kind of zone as the nightcrawler does as jake gyllenhaal's nightcrawler Nightcrawler, um, his character, you know, if you if you identify your acting character with a with an animal, um, Nightcrawler is obviously some sort of coyote. Um, we see the coyote also in Collateral that I mentioned. I remember there's a scene where Jamie Foxx comes across the the coyote on the road. I'm not sure what Joaquin Joaquin Phoenix is. He's more of a he's some kind of slithering character. He's more like a worm. Um, and sort of twisted up like some sort of caterpillar worm. Um, and maybe that leads into some sort of monarch imagery. I'd have to explore, but I don't know. But um, he, he's, he's, he's sinewy and he's twisted and he's, he's like this and he's kind of, he's, he looks sickly and wormish. Like you see this guy and you, you think this is, cr- this is creepy. And there's a scene where he's taking a picture of a, uh, older, you know, fat guy, uh, some kind of businessman at the mall, and he says, you know, are you taking this for your wife? And the guy says, yes. And then he says, um, he says, oh, okay. And he goes up and he, he like puts the light right in the guy's face, right in the guy's face. And he's he says, no, don't move, don't move. It's all part of the process. He puts the light right in his face. And then finally the guy gets uncomfortable and he pushes him and they, they sort of you know, tussle a little bit, and then Joaquin Phoenix grabs the guy's necktie and strangles him with it. I saw that. That's supposed to be, obviously, as a film watcher, the symbolism there is that the the 1950s uh, post-war, I guess, what would you say? The 1950s post-war capitalism is strangling the man's instinct, right? You can't be free. I don't know, something like that. But he's strangling him with his necktie, and the guy kind of chads him off, and then you know Joaquin Phoenix falls into this table, and then he runs out of the mall. He's also had this weird affair with this girl, um, and then he's going to end up on a on a like a you know a, a cabbage farm, and he's a so he's truly drifting. I mean, now he's moved into like the 1950s version of 1930s grapes of wrath and he's like he's like you know chopping cabbages and he's with these um you know migrant workers and then he again makes some liquor and then the old guy goes blind drunk they chase him out now now this is interesting because we've seen him on a ship outside of the united states sort of free in a way i mean notice the one scene where we again we have a god's eye view we're looking down and we see joaquin phoenix sprawled out on this uh, gun, on this destroyer, I guess it's a destroyer, on a gun, and 
he's he's drunk, but he's like perched up on this gun, and the other guys are down below and they're throwing things at him. But he's, I guess, his character is free, right uh, on the open sea. Now we see um, that mute button works handily. Uh, now we see that he is on land, but he's running, and the camera's tracking him along. And we see kind of, if you notice this part, we have waves. It's just waves in terms of the, the crop lines. So the crop lines sort of form these, these waves, and we're kind of running along, and we're seeing him run out into the distances. Then we catch up with him, and he sees uh, he's like on the coast, I guess he's in California. He's on the coast, and we see that there's a some sort of a yacht. We know this is going to be where, you know, Hubbard's yacht is, a bunch of people on the yacht, and he gets onto the boat. He drinks, and he ends up blind drunk, and the next thing we know, he's waking up. There's a lot of sleeping in this movie. He wakes up, and um, Amy Adams says, you know, it's it's okay. She she's the We're going to learn that she's the wife of Lancaster Dodd, and she takes him in to see the captain of this vessel. The captain of the vessel is going to be Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, Philip Seymour Hoffman is so good in this movie. Um, again, this is like masterclass in acting. This is this is fantastic. And Rob Ager recently covered this uh, over on his channel, um, the, the informal processing scene. So he goes into this room and he sees Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman says, would you like some informal processing? He says, sure. He says, do you know what that is? No. He sits down, and he begins asking him questions. And what this does is he informally invites him into a situation where he sees that this guy needs help, and he's going to sort of buck all the rules of therapy or psychology, and then he's going to switch midway through the scene into formal processing, right? And... What's going to happen here is um, he's going to press him. He's going to press him very hard. Uh, before that, he gives him, when, he's, when he walks into the room, he gives him a, a glass. You know, he's made a jug of this moonshine. And there's a great scene where he, I'll, I'll, you want me to just do it? He hands, he hands Philip Seymour Hoffman the, the drink. And he goes, <laughs> this is, there's a lot of, Philip Seymour Hoffman does a lot of mouth and, and n like noise acting. Right, so he goes like this. He goes, he goes, ah, 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 oh God, <laughs> and they bond over this drink, and then he gets him into the processing, and then at the end of the processing. He goes, he's, you know, he's, he, he says things like, he'll say things like, did you run away from your father? Did you, did you run away from your father? Did you run away from your father? Did you run away from your father? End of session. You're the bravest boy I've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> so do you get what's happening here? The processing is Scientology. You know, we know this is, it's never mentioned in the film. Obviously, well, they probably can't even, Legally, they probably can't even do this in the film. You know, you can't you can't get his name into a film, or at least a critique, or any or any kind of depiction of Hubbard in the film because of, of various things. So he calls him Lancaster Dodd, almost like he becomes the god of Joaquin Phoenix because he wants to. You know, he's his master. Now we know what Philip Seymour Hoffman's character wants in this. He wants to. Uh, I guess in in one way he wants to fix him, but we don't really know what Joaquin Phoenix's character wants. It's not that he wants to be fixed ever. It's that he, it you know, Anderson does this great thing in all of his films where he doesn't he doesn't tell you what the characters want or what you're supposed to get from the scene. Instead, um, instead you simply are just there going along with this guy and he's truly drifting, right? So he's a drifter, but now he's found this like safe haven where this guy's listening to him and it becomes very uncomfortable, uncomfortable for him as time goes on. Um, they get back to shore 
and he takes him in. He's now part of this organization. Uh, and we the, the yacht has sailed from the West Coast all the way. Th- he says we're sailing through the Panama Canal. Uh, we're, we're sailing through the Panama Canal. Mm. Well, we're sailing through the Panama Canal. I can't do a Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> but they end up in New York, and they end up at this mansion. And, of course, this is going to be one of the socialites who is supporting Lancaster Dodd, right? Um, yeah, no, ours ours is, is scheduled for tomorrow. Yeah, we got it tomorrow. Uh, I'll be on Rachel's channel tomorrow at 7. Um, and we go into this house, and they really do a great— I mean, the, the film really—you be, really believe that you're in the 1950s in this— in this house, and of course, you're wondering, oh, where's Joaquin Phoenix going to fit into all this? So he goes into the back, and he he starts looking for things to steal. Like, he picks up, like, a little statuette. He tries to fit it in his coat pocket. It won't fit. And then we see that Lancaster Dodd is doing a um, a processing session with this old lady, and it's essentially hypnotism. Um, what he says is that he is breaking the hypnotism of life, and he says, you... You have lived many lives before this. Yes. You see, you see, we are spirits trapped in human form. Evolution teaches us that we are animals, but we are not animals. We are not animals. Yes, animals are trapped in their form. The animals are below us. We, the animals, serve us. Truly, we are spirits, but we exist in one form or another throughout time. I remember I remember you on the plains. I remember you on the plains of Athens fighting you. I remember you in Carthage. We were in Caesar's army. Which is a very patent George C. Scott thing to say that you, you know, were Scipio Africanus in a past life. But that's what he starts to tell people. And and one of the things in the processing, by the way, is he says are you here now? Are you here with me now? Are you a grifter? Are you trying to steal from me? Are you lying to me? Do you come from another planet? Are you a phaser blaster being from another planet? But he throws these questions in because of, of course, because of Hubbard's uh, cosmology. But um, later on, we'll learn that uh, he, that, Lancaster Dodd is being sued by, I guess, this same lady because of uh, unauthorized, you have taken unauthorized funds. What do you mean? Do you have no honor, sir? I have taken unauthorized funds. Do you have no honor? No, Freddy. No, Freddy. (laughs) Freddy Quell. So he's basically, this guy's a scam artist and he's a grifter. And a guy even confronts him at the party, and he says, excuse me, excuse me, and at first you think, this guy's annoying. He's trying to hypnotize this lady. Uh, and the guy says, well, I just wonder, you know, you even, you even said that your methods could cure leukemia. And he says, yes, they have been known on instances to cure leukemia. And he says, well, I think that's a very dangerous thing to say. And he says, big fuck! <laughs> so... One thing in common between Lancaster Dodd and uh, Daniel Plainview is this sort of relentless ability to shuck off any kind of criticism with a verbal violence. Um, they will not have it uh, because they're sing- they're single minded, you know, in their in their attempt to conquer other people. Um, later that night, of course, we'll see that Freddie will have this uh, strange loyalty to Lancaster Dodd where he and uh, what's-his-face from Bohemian Rhapsody, that guy, the guy who kind of, he talks, he kind of tries to talk like Hemingway. What's that guy's name? The guy who won the Oscar, the young guy, uh, Mr. Robot. What's that guy's name? They show up at that guy's house and they beat him up in his apartment. And, uh, and, Anyway, I'm 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 kind of dragging here with this one, but but what happens basically is that Freddie Quell will will go with Lancaster Dodd, and one one interesting thing about this is that clearly we're we're uh, you know talking about Hubbard, and 
I don't, I think that, yeah, Rami Malik, thank you. Um, I think that um, Anderson does one weird thing here um, where instead of discussing Hubbard like we would in hindsight or what we know now, or even like if we're going to talk, you know, if it was some sort of uh, biopic, we're actually meeting Hubbard at a place where he is at his, uh, the top of his beginning phase, and he's popular for a reason, okay? Now, the guy at the party brings up that this could, you know, this seemed like a cult, right? And it, and it, it is. But in order for the cult to work, people have to be attracted to it, and they have to see something in it, right? And one thing that's different about this cult is the wide array of people who find themselves within the the tentacles of Lancaster Dodd. And we see that a lot of these people are society people because he needs the money. But it's interesting because this is one cult that's still there. It's still successful. So we see why in this film, because, because post-war 1950s, we see that people are sort of lost, not in a post-World War I way, but they're, they're lost in the, Post a bomb, uh, truly postmodern world, where they're lost. They they seem to find no meaning. They have no grounding, and so they it's the origins of the self help movement. Now, of course, you know there's nothing in here about Crowley's influence on Hubbard. There's there's hardly any of the esoteric elements in this. Um, it's just straight up a depiction of Hubbard in his overall daily lifestyle and how he's able to convince these people of what they're, and, and, que and Freddie Quell is his big, is his big test because if he can get this guy, really he can get anyone and everybody else has problems, but they don't have problems like this guy has, right? He is a complete drifter and we're going to, we're actually going to see in the film, you know, it moves on, it, it moves on. And then there's a scene where towards the end of the film, they go out to the salt flats. I guess they're at the Bonneville salt flats. And Philip Seymour Hoffman <laughs> is in his, uh, you know, Ralph Lauren motorcycle gear. And he's got his cuffs rolled up in his leather jacket. And he's on a Triumph motorcycle. And he says, the, g the game here, the game here is to, it's called pick a point. You will pick a point in the distance. And you will go as fast as you can and go to that point. You will go to that point. <laughs> so he goes to that point and then he comes and he's riding his motorcycle and he's, it doesn't look like he's going very fast. He's kind of bumping, <laughs> bumping up and down. And his daughter's out there. Yay, daddy. And he comes back. Jesse Plemons plays his son, by the way. And it's amazing how much Jesse Plemons looks like Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's crazy casting. Um, so then he gives, he says, Freddie, now it's your turn. And he, the bike is turned around, pick a point. And he says, and Freddie says, Freddie says, <sighs> that fork. Yes, that fork, in the, that fork between the mountains. I see it. So he gets on his motorcycle and he goes. And then time kind of passes. And we see Lancaster Dodd say, he, he goes, he's going very fast. And guess what? What happens is exactly what you think is going to happen in the film, which is he goes and he never comes back. He takes the motorcycle and he leaves. And he goes off and he ends up, I suppose, uh, back on the East Coast somehow. And he, his goal is to go back and meet up with, I forget her name, Doris. Doris is a woman, a girl that he was in love with who was uh, you know, half Norwegian. And part of his problem is that he that he reveals in his processing is that he drifted away from this girl and he abandoned her for no reason. There's a lot of abandonment in Anderson movies. He abandoned her for no reason. And he has wanted to go back. He's imagined going back many times, but he hasn't. He also revealed by the way that he was, a, um, he was a creeper with his aunt and, uh, and Lancaster Dodd says, why, why, what did what was your reason? He says, because I was drunk and because she looked good or whatever. So he's, this guy's just a, just a worm. He's just a worm character, kind of like Jimmy the Gator, kind of like the worm character in the first movie. 
right? Um, yes, just like in uh, There Will Be Blood, right? He abandoned his soy. He abandoned his soy. <laughs> so he goes back to the house and he learns that his, this girl um, is gone. She is, uh, she's, you know, married and she's living somewhere else. One of the, uh, one of the other interesting things that Anderson does really well in this is that during during the processing scenes, um, there's a way that I haven't seen in film before. This is he uses this very effectively. Freddie closes his eyes and he imagines himself in his life going through the events that he describes in his kind of therapy, right? And we, when we see this, if you aren't paying attention, you kind of think, why is this a flashback, right? You see him, you see him in like his navy blues and he's going to see the girl. And one really cool thing that Anderson does is he doesn't depict like a younger version of Joaquin Phoenix. Instead, we see Freddie Quell as he is now with a haggard face, right? He's all kind of twisted up and worm like. But in his navy blues, and it's very, it's disconcerting, it's off-putting when you see it, because you see this older man in his younger navy uniform, and it just looks creepy. But you realize it's because we're seeing the mental projection of himself when he was younger, and he's living in that moment. So, of course, that's part of Scientology, right? It, it's the, it's this, the past lives and the, the, all, all the space stuff, right, and the spirit inhabiting a body. <laughs> So we see that sort of in real time when we watch it. It's very, it's very um, clever how he does it. And then we kind of, we, we don't really jump back to the character in the present time, but we kind of sort of just, it's like we just kind of blend back into the present time and then he opens his eyes and we see him again. But none of that is explained and you have to, you have to watch it to see how he shows us the events. Well, um, there's another scene where key scene where he gets arrested. Uh, Lancaster Dog gets arrested. We kind of discussed that. You have no honor. And when he goes to jail, Freddie goes to jail too because he attacks the cops. And when he goes in jail into the jail, they put it, they're put in jail cells next to each other. And and um, it's interesting the dichotomy between Lancaster Dog is stoic and still. And in the next scene, you know, in the next cage, we see this caged animal. I mean, he really is a caged animal. He destroys his jail cell, which is like a porcelain toilet and a bed. And he's he's hitting his back and his, his shoulder, back of his shoulders and his head on this bed, on this bunk bed. And he really destroys, he's like a caged animal. And we see that this is who he really is. And this is a truly animal spirit. And it, it, it harkens back to what he was saying earlier about animals. Um, and I suppose that his mission, Dodd's mention, uh, mission, is to quell the animal spirit in Freddy Quell. But he's unable to do that. And in fact, at the end of the movie, when they meet up, he, 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 he somehow contacts him in a movie theater, of all places. Like he's watching the cinema of his life. Freddy Quell is in there alone in a movie theater watching the events you know, pan out before him on a screen. And he gets a phone call from uh, Amy Adams, um, who then says, "You know, uh, you know, Father, oh, uh, you know, uh, Lancaster, Dodd, you know, Dodd, Master wants to see you." And then he gets this uh, this message from Lancaster Dodd: "Come to England. We 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 await you." And then he makes it all the way to England, and he sees him. And when he gets there, he's told, "We don't want you." And it's crazy because in that scene. Philip Seymour Hoffman tells him, like, this is your chance. I want you to stay. But if you leave, he says, if you leave, you and I will be enemies for the rest of time. And in the next life, you and I will be mortal enemies and we shall meet on the plains of Sisyphus <laughs> or whatever he says. And then he's gone. So there's no resolution to the movie except that their lives go on, and Freddie continues to be who he is, and Lancaster Dodd continues to be who he is, and it's just uh, drifting. So he's kind of master of, of everyone, master of none, and he cannot get this guy, which is interesting because that's the exact kind of type of guy you would think that he would get, but he doesn't. So 
it, it's, a, it's a strange kind of character study. Um, but the the movie is great because, number one, the performances are fantastic, and Philip Seymour Hoffman is great. Joaquin Phoenix is is absolutely fantastic. And we see these weird, um, you know, eyes wide shut parties where he's always singing these cringy songs, right? And all the women are naked, including the old, the old, the, all the old bags are naked, and Lancaster Dodd is, Philip Seymour Hoffman is, and the little sailor went around the world. And the world was full of twirls. Like, he's singing these weird songs, dude. And then he sings one to him at the end of the film, right? Um, <laughs> and so it's supposed to be this kind of post-hypnotic, uh, you know, uh, a trance-freeing uh, psychological tool for confronting the past. But it ends up just being reliving the past and never being free from it. And ensnaring you in this larger cult, right? So I'll do the Philip Seymour Hoffman drink one more time. And then we'll go on to There Will Be Blood, okay? So he goes, he goes like this. He goes, mm, 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 yes, mm, 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 mm. Then he goes, he goes, oh, 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 God, oh, God, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's uh, the master. So now, uh, remember to smash that like, everybody. Please think about um, supporting me. Please uh, um, support me with those links that are in the channel description, the video description that my uh, friends are dropping throughout, that Jethro and Jason and them are dropping throughout. I see Jerry in the chat right there. Shouts out to Jerry. Hope you guys are enjoying this kind of loose uh, interpretation of you know, analysis of these three uh, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson uh, films. And I hope that wasn't too loud. I hope my audio is going good. I hope I didn't blow the speakers by doing that. And last thing is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and figure out how, oh, how, yeah, yeah, I cannot wear headphones the whole time. This is, <laughs> what's that REM? Remember the REM video? I'm oh, sorry. Boom, 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 boom. Sorry. You remember that? Where he's wearing the headphones. Whenever I wear, I see, I wear, I've had to wear headphones. I always think of that. It's the one that Beavis and Butthead said, this sucks. <laughs> but, um, you know, hopefully the audio is going well. And again, shouts out to Grunt out there, Grunt Smash, for getting me this uh, vocaster. And once I get it going, I'm sure audio is going to be, hopefully it's way better than it's been before, you guys. Um, and because this thing is very fancy. I'm just boomer teching it. So I'm trying to figure it out. All right, so let's move on to my favorite of the three movies, and that is There Will Be Blood. So There Will Be Blood came out in 2007. This is uh, Paul Thomas Anderson wrote and directed this movie. It's based on the um, Upton Sinclair novel Oil, and it stars Daniel Day-Lewis. Now, <clears throat> I had a lot, um, a lot of mental time invested into this film because... Uh, let's see, Jason says, I can't copy it for the Dillonese because I'm on a mobile Android. Oh, you're on Android. Dang. <laughs> Sorry. That sucks. Uh, no, but um, I saw this movie, I think, four times in the theater um, because I, you know, I love Daniel Day-Lewis. He went to my drama school. Um, he came by one time um, when, he, uh, when he was up in the Oscars for Gangs of New York. We were at drama school and we stayed up all night waiting to see if he won and then hoping he would come by the next day or the next week. He didn't win for that. He's won three times, though. Um, for this, for Lincoln, and for My Left Foot in 1989. Film in 1989. But anyway, um, so, yes, he won the Oscar for this as Daniel Plainview. Now, what happens in this film is that uh, this is the story of, of essentially, of um, a character in the late 19th into the early 20th century who rises from silver miner to oil prospector to oil tycoon and we see in the background how the how oil becomes an industry and we also see his family or lack of a family life and his um his 
Nemesis, who is this character, Eli Sunday, played by Paul Dano. This is fantastic. Um, and how they play out, and then eventually, um, you know, they will they will be at odds with each other, and then in the end, um, spoiler alert, you know, he will murder him, and that's the end of the film. Now, what is the film really about? Well, okay, let's start from the beginning. So, the first thing that we see in the movie is there there are no words spoken in this movie for a good, what, seven to 15 minutes. There's no dialogue. All we see is the dust and the landscape and the kind of primordial um, rocks and, and muck and ooze, right, with the oil. And, and obviously you could, you could say that, you could say that Daniel Plainview is supposed to represent some sort of evolutionary, you know, figure, right? Um, I think that he's more of a. He, wh what is he? He's more of a. He's more of a pure sort of Nietzschean. Um, will will man in this a uh, complete complete sociopath, uh, totally singular in his mission. But what is his mission? Well, his mission is is not it's not money, it's not um riches. Even when he has everything at the end of the film, um, he still looks like he looks like a drifter actually, and he's a kind of an alcoholic mess. I guess he just he lives completely in the senses, and for him for himself to 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 accomplish his goal at hand. So at the beginning, we see this nothingness, and we see uh, Daniel Plainview. We see um you know, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, and he is uh, in a, a silver mine, and he's kind of chipping away, he's chipping away at the walls, and we see that he um, he goes up and he puts some dynamite in there, and he's, you know, this guy's like completely self-sufficient, but notice that uh, whenever he gains anything in the movie, he always has to sacrifice something. Um, for instance, he, he, he builds a device like that will hold him up, when he go and and then he's got the ladder and he go, he's going down the ladder into the silver mine after he blows the dynamite and he he you know he's polishing with spit I mean this is like real prospector right and he finds a chunk of silver and then when he's going back up when he's going back up right out of the de profundis right out of the abyss. We see that he he breaks the ladder and then he falls and he breaks his leg. So then he crawls all the way from he's crawling like out of the muck, out of the darkness, out of the underground. He's like crawling along these rocks with his broken leg all the way to town where they're crushing the silver. They weigh it and they give him his first check and he's made a little bit of money. There's still no word spoken. Then we see that he's got a crew together. And uh, they're back at the hole, and they um, they discover black gold ooze coming from this this hole. And now he builds a what's the weight thing that he has? Like he this weight goes into the thing. He drops it in. It's like a lead weight, and he's you know wrenching it back and forth. And eventually, when he discovers like real oil. Um, and he, and there's a there's a flow of it. He's down there with this guy. The guy has a baby that he's brought to the work site, but the guy's down in the hole, and the lead weight they'll hoist it up, and then bam, it'll go down, and it will um, impale the guy in the hole. So now Daniel Plainview um, takes on the baby, and he essentially adopts the baby, and we see him giving whiskey to the baby. Um, and later on, he's going to say, "A baby in a basket." A baby in a basket. So now we're going to start to see Daniel Plainview. We start to hear his words and hear him talk for the first time. Now, the way that he talks in the movie is obviously supposed to be John Houston. He has a John Houston accent. Right. Um, and what he does is he is, he is, um, he is, uh, a guy approaches him and his name is Paul Sunday. Now, a lot of people, I think, forget in this movie or they miss that there are two Paul Dano characters, right? They're, they're actually twin brothers. There's Paul Sunday and there's Eli Sunday. Now, the question might be, okay, are these both the same guys? Is one of them 
is he playing like he has a brother and then he just switches his personality? But I think that there are twins. Uh, Paul Sunday comes to him and tells him, if you go to this tract of land, right, the bandy tract, um, you'll see that there is oil coming up out of the ground. And if I give you um, the location of this place and where, you know, if I tell you where it is, you owe me $10,000. Well, Kieran Hines is also there, the great Kieran Hines from Belfast. Kieran Hines is uh, Liam Neeson's best friend. He's also involved with funding the Lyric Theater. I think he went to Queens where I went. Well, Liam Neeson went there. I don't know if Kieran I think Kieran Hines went there. But um, Kieran Hines is his kind of, uh, his kind of uh, assistant. And uh, they say, okay, well, how do we know that you're telling the truth? Well, it turns out that he's telling the truth. He goes to the bandy track with his boy, and we see him use his boy as a way to, you know, get himself in with this family that owns the bandy track. Well, he gets there, and he's quail. We're queer quail. And he sees this family, and the family comes out. You know, he's, he's, he sets up his tent. He's kind of walking around their territory. And this uh, family comes out, and it's these two girls, you know, and then a dad. The dad's name is Abel. And the dad, you know, he says, my son and I are quail hunting. We were wondering if you might have some milk, perhaps, or some eggs that we could eat. And then eventually he'll go in and he'll talk to the family. When he goes in and talks to the family, he's going to say, um, you know, th they'll have a meeting in the town. And, uh, and he'll say, my name is Daniel Plainview. I'm a simple man. I'm a simple man. I'm here with my, my son. And we are here uh, wondering if uh, you, we see that you have oil here. Now, I'm a fair man, and I'm here to tell you, right? And basically, then we, we, he gives the speech, and then we hear the, the people in the, in, the, in the meeting kind of erupt because they don't want to be taken advantage of. But what he's there to do is to get their, their rights. He wants everything under their land. Um, what's going to end up happening is, He's going to buy all of the land around their land. And then he's going to, then eventually he's going to set up a pipeline all the way to the ocean. And he's going to move the oil from one place to another. And this is the beginning of the oil boom uh, in this country. Now, this is based on a real character. Uh, and the first 150 pages of, of the book Oil are based on this character, and it, it, it takes a different track because the book is more about Eli, uh, is about his um, his son and how his son goes off to World War One, but but the movie is about Daniel Plainview, and he's going to set up an oil derrick, and then but he's going to be confronted by he's going to say he's gonna, his nemesis is going to be Eli Sunday. Eli, of course, Eli, uh, biblical name Eli L, right, name for God, and Sunday, and we're gonna we think at first. Possibly that this is going to be a conflict between good guy and bad guy, typical Hollywood. But it actually ends up being something sort of uh, really Nietzschean, um, which is sort of in this territory that in in the in light of the film is beyond good and evil. And what I mean by that is that both characters are likable in a way, but both characters are totally unlikable. Both characters are villains. They're both bad. And Eli Sunday is going to end up being exactly what we see him be throughout the film, which is a false prophet. He even admits to it at the end of the film. But Eli Sunday is going to say, um, we'll give you this land if you agree to um, pay for my church, pay for my ministry, pay for schools, uh, and pay for all this stuff, right? Which is... Very savvy. I mean, Eli Sunday is the son of Abel. It also makes me wonder, you know, if the dad's name is Abel, right, and we have these two twin brothers um, that are the sons of Abel, I mean, you would think that they would be the Cain and Abel figures, but they're not. So it makes me wonder if Eli Sunday is a kind of Grendel, right? I mean, we did Beowulf, and, and Grendel is spawned from the mire and the muck, right? And... uh you know, that that Cain gives birth to all number of creatures and, uh, you know, bad spirits in, in Beowulf. I did the Beowulf analysis really twice, so you can go back and watch that. I did that in the um, Dragons stream most recently. But I guess Eli Sunday is supposed to be that, but he just has a good cover. Well, we see um, 
Daniel Plainview set up this oil derrick, and he's, you know, oil is flowing, and he's making money. We don't really see the money, but we know that he's making money. He's eventually, he is um, confronted by representatives of uh, Rockefeller, and the Rockefeller group basically says, we will um, we'll buy your, your rights, we'll buy your company, and Daniel Plainview says, are you telling me how to raise my son? No, Daniel, I'm not. Are you telling me how to raise my son? And he picks a fight with them. He's drunk, but he picks a fight with them. And this is because of his singular will. I mean, you could see this as like a variation of the self-made man, especially, I mean, this movie really does get, in a way, the early 20th century oil people better than any other movie. I can't think of another movie which really gets to the truth of this in terms of who they were as characters. Uh, Not all of them, but, you know... uh, what we think of, right? And so he's he he won't be bought out, uh, but he but he he goes through subterfuge and he buys out everybody else. And eventually, the oil derrick catches on fire, and the boy is deaf. He goes deaf, right, because he's there for the explosion. And now, the the really terrible scene is that yes, they own the railroad. Is that um. Plainview sees that he can't do anything with his son and and he can't use him anymore. Really, it's because he can't use him anymore like he did because he's no longer a charming boy. He's now he has a problem, right? So he puts him on this train and he gets on the train with him and then he stands up and he says, I'll be right back. And then he gets off the train and leaves. The boy sees him off the train and I guess it's Kieran Hines on the train. Make sure that he gets to this special school in New York or wherever it is. So he does kind of exactly what the what the elites were doing at the time anyway and now, which is, you know, send you send your boy off to boarding school, you know, at a young age. He has no mother. He has no mother anyway. Um, but all sort of the mother the mother figure will be will be drawn out from him. And then eventually, if it were not this kid, he would be he would grow up and then he would go to you know, one of the great universities, and then he would be sent off to govern one aspect of the corporations or the or the or the government in some far flung region, right? You'd be go go be governor of Singapore or run the run the oil industry and and talk to the Shah of Iran or whatever. But this kid, um, it's because he's sent off because and he actually what's interesting is he actually becomes more um emotional as time goes on because he's gonna appear later. Um at, uh, as a teenager, and he's going to confront his father, um, and he's actually more of a human being, right? And that's when he gets confronted with that scene, you know, you, I found you. Um, and so, yeah, Jason says, oil is basically machine blood enabling mechanized tech like a demonic fluid. I mean, I think of oil as, <laughs> I think of oil as the kind of blood of the earth, right? It allows the, it allows the earth to, to move, kind of like the human body. I mean, God created that so that the human body can have fluid that allows the various parts of the corpus to move. And it's the same with the earth as an organism, right? Um, But the way it is in this, it's like the, the process of getting the blood from the earth is has a real kind of demonic uh, energy to it because of all the death that occurs and the will of the people doing this and how, how, you know, people are kind of thrown into these pits and covered in the black goo and mire and muck and then impaled and left there and their children are stolen. Um, and then Daniel Plainview uses them as these kind of, you know, avatars for, gaining sympathy from other people and it just continues. Um, let's see, what does he end up doing then? He, um, he, uh, won't sell the, the thing. Uh, he ends up building the pipeline. Oh, then he, then he gets uh, one thing that happens is a guy comes to him and says, I'm your brother. And so you figure when you're watching it, that this guy is a fake somehow, but Daniel Plainview does, you know, he says, Oh, well, I'll, t- I'll take you in, you know? And he, he kind of shows him the business, but then there's a discrepancy in something that he says, and and he says, I don't, you know, the guy says, I don't want money. I don't want anything. He says, I don't want money. I don't want anything. But then later when they go to, like, they go to a whorehouse or a bar or something, and 
They're celebrating, and Daniel Plainview's drunk, but then the brother says, Can, give me some more money, give me some more money. And I think that's the point when he realizes that um, this guy was lying. And they go back out. They're, they're sitting by the sea. They go out swimming in the ocean, uh, which is almost taken out of the master. You know, the, the, they're out in this open spaces. And later that night, he, um, he, his brother wakes up, and Plainview has a pistol to his head and says, who are you? And the guy admits, uh, I'm not your brother. I didn't, I didn't, I met a guy who said he was your brother. He had this diary and I didn't kill him, but he died. And so I just thought I would come and, and take up his life because his brother is kind of a Freddie Quell character from the master, isn't he? Also, notice the way that the relationships work in this with father and son or with the older people. I mean, you know, Abel, for one, Abel um, is abusing his daughter in the movie, if you didn't notice that. And and um, Plainview goes over to her at one point and puts his arm around her and looks at the father and says, there will be no more, there will be no more of that. There will be no more hitting. So he saves the daughter, but he can't save his own son, even though he did save his son because his son is not his son and his son was abandoned. He didn't have a father and he saved his son and he sends him off for his education, but, but then he uses them. So then he doesn't save him, and then he, he abandons him himself. So it's interesting. I guess it's, it's kind of whatever fits his temporary plan. Um, he also, um, he, he decides to uh, build the pipeline. So he builds a pipeline to move the oil from the derricks to the ocean where he can move it, I guess, on ships. Um, and he can transport it because now we're getting into, you know, large oil production. And he's obviously making a lot of money. Even though we don't see his money, we never see, we The only times we see his money are really with the check at the very beginning of the movie, the house at the end of the movie, and... The fact that you know he must have money, but but he himself doesn't really change throughout this thing. He's just kind of this stalking, skulking character through the landscape, and so he so he he kills his brother. He shoots him in the head, and then he buries him. And the bandy tract is owned by I might have confused the bandy tract and the and the tract at the beginning, but the bandy tract is owned by these two uh, Appalachian looking fellas, an old fella and a young fella. And when he wakes up, they're sitting there, and he knows that they know that he's killed his so-called brother. Um, so again, he's made this, he's sort of, he's made this sacrifice, and then his business pushes forward. Well, f fast forward to the end of the movie, and we see that, oh, oh, I forgot, Eli Whitney, I mean Eli Whitney, Eli Sunday. Eli Sunday um, is constantly confronting uh, Daniel Plainview. That's his nemesis in the movie. And, one, you know, at one point, he uh, approaches him while they're out in the field, um, you know, like at an oil derrick, and he comes up to him and he says, um, you know, he, he kind of criticizes him, I think. And Daniel Plainview, Daniel Day-Lewis, grabs him and th shoves him into the muck and gives him this weird kind of mud, evil, sort of evil mud anti-baptism. And we see that Eli Sunday screams like a girl. He has no way to um, to defend himself. And really all he wants is more money. He says, where's the money that you owe me? Where's the money that you, you owe me? And he won't pay him. Daniel, Daniel Plainview won't pay him. Eventually, it comes to a point where they we see Eli Sunday's uh, church service. And his church service is this, you know, shed built... It's not a tent, but it's a it's a shed built oil derrick Pentecost sort of Pentecostal Gnostic ceremony, right? Where it's called the uh, third, it's called the Church of the Church of the Third Revelation, I think, which reminded me of Grimsby, right? Grimsby's uh, Church of the Final Judgment. And in order for Daniel Plainview to get what what he wants, he has to agree to be baptized in the scene. And so this is where Paul Dano's character, I mean, this is a great scene. Paul Dano, he, you know, he makes him get on his knees and he slaps him, right? And 
he slaps him across the face, which is a almost Masonic what he does in that in that ceremony. He slaps him across the face and he says, uh, "You abandoned your boy, didn't you?" And he goes, "I abandoned my child. I abandoned my child. I abandoned my soy. I abandoned my soy. I abandoned my soy. Give me the blood, Lord. Give me the blood, Lord." Well. What's unspoken in that scene is when he says, give me the blood, there's a part where you know, yeah, it's, hum- it's a ritual humiliation. You notice that um, he, there's a scene where after the baptism, he stands up and he talks to Paul Dano, but there's no audio. We just see his lips moving. And I think that's the scene where he says, there will be blood indeed. Oh, there will be blood. And he, so he's promising right there that he's going to have his come up and he's going to murder him in the end. Because of this humiliation. Now, that's a that's a weird mirroring that occurs because Plainview came from the muck out of the ground, and Eli Sunday came from above ground, but he's kind of this defeat character. We know that both characters realize that the other is scamming everyone. Plainview takes his thing, but he but he won't pay up. Eli Sunday finally gets his and then when he gets his money after this he goes off and he starts his you know copeland ministry or whatever and then at the end of the film um plainview is living in this um tudor mansion in california and he's all alone and he's eating he's he's basically a, a a beast he's a beast man he's a beast caveman and we see him on the floor of this bowling alley and he's uh, eating steak like and he's constantly pulling bits of gristle out of his out of his mouth like he's just a he's a beast and he's drinking and he's you know he falls asleep on his bowling alley or whatever and we see there's the scene where his son comes and confronts him and his son says I don't want anything from you anymore and he has a translator um and he tells him you're a baby in a basket you were a baby in a basket he tells his son, get out. I never want to see you again. But the son is through with him. So his son is released from his uh, plight, right, from his oppression. Um, he's released from, first of all, knowing, you know, wondering whether Plainview was his dad or not. Now he knows that he wasn't his dad, so he doesn't have his genes in him. Uh, he's also released from any kind of, you know, fealty to this character. Because Daniel Plainview is... Uh, you know, somebody says he's a demon. I mean, he really is. He he is so demonic in this movie in terms of his his just. It's interesting because you have the beast, right? He's kind of the great beast, and then you have Paul Dano, who is the false prophet, in the movie. And when he shows up at the end and he confronts Daniel Plainview, he thinks that his new position. He's all in black and he's got this prominent cross. He thinks that his new position is going to allow him some sort of parity with him. But in fact, it doesn't, and he makes him admit, he says, admit that you're a false prophet, and he admits it, right? So, Eli Sunday says, I'm a false, he says he's a false prophet, he did it for the money, and he needs his money now. He needs to keep going and do what he's doing. I mean, it's just, it's all based on grift, right? Graft, grift. And then he confronts him, uh, plain view confronts him plain view confronts him with a bowling pin right he tells him the milkshake story he says look i never even used your oil i don't owe you any money because i went through your listen listen your land is here and i put a pipe here and then i buried the pipe right through there and I, you have no oil left. There's, it's worthless. There's nothing there. And I drank it all the way here. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. He's emptied him. He's emptied. He's taken. He's literally taken the, everything out from the ground from under him. He's he's removed the ground, the substance of the ground from under him. And so Eli Sunday is now empty. Because he knows he has no money and no oil and no and nothing to stand on, no more lies that he can use. And what does Plainview do to resolve this? He bashes his brains in with a bowling pin, like he's the ape at the beginning of two thousand one: A Space Odyssey, like he is the ape throwing the 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 bone in the air, right? 
and realizing that he can conquer through violence, and that is the end. That's the end. It's it's resolved. That's that's the end. The 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 servant comes downstairs, Mister Plainview. Everything all right down here? And you wonder what's he going to do. I mean, is this the end? Is is he going to? I guess he's just going to have the body buried and he's just going to keep on and then just die. He's going to just going to die a beast. But one thing to think of is with this is that the physicality as the actors call it the way the the characters physically resemble their inner their inner selves is amazing i mean we see this with joaquin phoenix he's so twisted and tied up with alcoholism and and nothingness and just this sinewy brute brute living of the senses that he ends up just this kind of twisted ghoul right well plainview does the same thing he can barely walk at the end of the movie he's kind of hobbling along you know, the rest of the movie, he's got an interesting gait. I mean, he walks like a, like he's almost bow-legged, like a cowboy. But it's very, uh, you know, it's very wiry. He has, he has a kind of wiry, wiry strength of someone who never eats. At the end of the movie, he's he's eating. All he does is eat, but he's not fat. He's still this, like, un, you know, un, he has this unquenchable, un unresolvable like hunger for just uh beast mode yes and so i thought i would look at uh a couple of things in this one um essay that i found on uh what is this on yeah it's on there will be blood on philosophy now because there are a couple interesting things here um so this says Terry Murray, Murray, again, which occurred at the beginning of um, Magnolia. Murray tells us about a Hollywood hero beyond good and evil. If Hollywood genre movies can be dependent upon to deliver one thing, it is a, it is a good hero pitted against an evil foe. Uh, simplistic though it is, Hollywood cinema seduces us with all these Manichaean conflicts that persuade us to side with the good guys. Paul Thomas Anderson's 2007 Oscar-winning There Will Be Blood marked a rare exception to this rule giving audiences an unconventional protagonist, one seemingly beyond good and evil. In a way, it is because they live in, in total hellscapian beast mode. Um, this is like a film that really shows the kind of personification of what Nietzsche would have you know, envisioned in history or in film. There will be oil, says... Uh, the narrative is a cinematic adaptation of Upton Sinclair's novel Oil, um, and it centers on the epic rise and ultimate decline of oil magnate Daniel Plainview. But this is no typical tale of poor boy made good, for Plainview is far from good in any moral sense. This, he has no morals. Despite his admirable characteristics, he does have admirable characteristics in terms of his, his, uh, his work ethic, I suppose, right? His work ethic, the fact that he never stops, that he keeps going in terms of um, exploration, in terms of, you know, making it. But it's without grounding, and it's at the cost of, of others, we've seen. And so I don't know if that's admirable. Instead, Plainview is a thoroughly Nietzschean figure, and one, and if one is seeking ways to, to vivify Nietzsche's philosophy, um, no one can do better than through this film. While Plainview embodies many aspects of Nietzsche's philosophy and personality, I will limit my focus to how the film illuminates Nietzsche's critique of Christianity. The parallels go far beyond Plainview's bushy mustache. Um, who wrote this? Again, I don't know who wrote this, but it's on philosophy now. Uh, the central, central conflict of There Will Be Blood is between Plainview, who is a plain-speaking businessman with big am ambitions in the burgeoning oil industry, and the hypocritical Christian preacher Eli Sunday, who shares Plainview, Plainview's ambition for wealth but doesn't want to get his hands dirty earning it. The film opens in 1898 when we see, so right on the cusp of the century, when we see Plainview making his first discovery and badly injuring his leg in the process. There's no dialogue during the opening scenes, and our attention is drawn instead to the raw, uncivilized physicality, there you go, of man as animal struggling against the elements. Several years pass, and again, we see Plainview prospecting for oil, this time with a team of colleagues, one of whom is killed in an accident at a primitive drilling site, leaving his son. Plainview adopts the orphan boy who goes by the name H.W. H.W. These early scenes of injury and death set the contours of what will follow. Destruction, loss, and injury is seen through the film as an integral part of all that is exceptional, energetic, life-affirming, and productive, not as antithetical to it 
is a means to greatness, progress, and flourishing. So it's truly Nietzschean, right? Um, and one thing about this is that, you know, it's not that th this is a good example of where Anderson made the movie, but these three movies, Magnolia, There Will Be Blood, and The Master, are so different. They have a unifying force, and they have a sort of unifying vision, but they're so different. Magnolia, for instance, is so different from this movie, right? So one can't say, this is a good example of the fact that one can't say what Anderson's particular worldview is as seen through his films. We see the vision of an artist showing an element of America. And I think these are three definite American films. I mean, these are purely American films. And it's also interesting that Anderson himself talks about the beginning, middle, and end of a film. You have the traditional markers of film. But this film is the sort of beginning of the 20th century. I mean, doesn't this get the 20th century and the beginnings of America in a way that I can't think of many other films getting? Then we have The Master as a postmodern film just after World War II, right? So the 1950s, mid-century. And then we get the end of the century with Magnolia, where we see a kind of a pre-Big Nine era, uh, just pre-post-postmodernism, you know, disconnectedness and loss, but unified through what looks to be the chance and the fate that Daniel Plainview, as Daniel Plainview would see it, you know, he's a kind of Nietzschean fatalist, I suppose, but which actually turns out to be a kind of exodus, an exodus from the century, an exodus from their terrible lives, an exodus, an exodus from the sins of, the, of their fathers and from the past. Whereas the master is about, you know, confronting the past in order to try and break free from it. T.J. Mackey, Tom Coombs' character, says in Magnolia that one need not confront the past. He says, the past lives where it lives, and I live in the present and the future. I don't need to confront the past in order to get what I need to from the, from the future. It's also interesting that T.J. Mackey passes himself off as a kind of Daniel Plainview figure 100 years forward. At least that's the way he presents himself. But we see that when it comes to it, that he actually ends up being more of a an H.W. character because he confronts his father and spills his emotions and his, he spills himself out on this deathbed. I forgot to mention that the Tom Cruise scene is remi highly reminiscent of Marlon, one of Marlon Brando's great scenes, which is the deathbed scene in uh, Last Tango in Paris, if you haven't seen that. Um, in fact, it's almost the same. Uh, Paul, the character's name is Paul in Last Thing on Paris. That's uh, Marlon Brando living in exile and living as a beast. He even says in the movie, I want to be, is Bernardo Bertolucci. He wants to be a beast. You know, the movie's about sort of, you know, 60s, 70s era Paris, post-war existing in this kind of, highly artistic, artistically charged atmosphere where this girl is the girlfriend of a film of a kind of cinema verite filmmaker and there's a lot of modern art that's shown at the beginning of the film. And Paul is seen as this kind of uh you know bon vivant living in Paris and he has this highly sexual relationship where they don't name it. They, they he says, no names. No, there's no names. There's no names. No, don't say my name. Don't say my name. Don't give me your name. They don't want any names. He he says, I want to be called Ugh or Grunt or Ugh. So he's a kind of, uh, you know, evolutionary beast character. But that's because of his trauma dealing from the death of his mother. There's a scene where he confronts his mother on, her, on the deathbed. I think she's actually dead. She's on her literal deathbed. And... He rails, rails against her just like Tom Cruise does in Magnolia. So we see this kind of resolution. There's a tying up in terms of the 20th century and leading us into the 21st century in, the, in these three films. They all have this through line. They all tie together. Um, but, um, but they're also different. And this film, 
is certainly it's almost Shakespearean or or I don't know perhaps Wagnerian without it's it's kind of an anti-Wagnerian film I suppose right it's Wagner without any kind of spirit in this movie um but it's Wagnerian in terms of its gravitas like the characters are full of this death like literal death right coming from the from underground and finally putting a character underground at the end of the film but it's all just it's just uh it's just beast and peter travers uh the rolling stone guy called this the number one film of the 20 of the 21st um, century uh children of men i think was two and it's interesting i put on my community tab um films that came out around uh 2013 you know, films come in these cycles and waves, and 2007 was no exception. I mean, 2007, there were a bunch of great movies that came out in, in 2007, uh, Children of Men 2006. But also remember that um, one movie that we've covered, which is No Country for Old Men, No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood were filmed in the same place in the same year. Isn't that crazy? That's wild. That's wild how the the sort of nexus converges in terms of art um, in these places. So in Marfa, Texas, um, uh, he says, um, he says, it is not until 1911, some 13 years after his final discovery, that we hear Plainview speak for the first time. Right? So it's lack of language. The movie begins with lack of language. It's just noises, grunts, and action. <laughs> which finally becomes language, and the language becomes the language of money in this movie, of course. He is by this time seeking to buy leases, there you go, on plots of land where he wishes to drill for oil, offering a share of his profits to the owners. Before long, a young man comes to tell him information about the location of a plot of oil-rich land that can be bought cheaply. He wants $500 cash for the information. Eventually, Plainview reaches an agreement with the shrewd young man who introduces himself as Paul Sunday from a poor family of goat farmers who can't grow anything on their land. Notice it's Eli and Paul. And he says, Paul, later in the movie, at the end of the movie, he says, Paul was the actual prophet. Paul was the one who sold, who got money out of me, sold it for $10,000 and then disappeared. Um, prophet in his eyes. Uh, but it's interesting that there's Abel, Paul, and Eli in terms of this family. Plainview wastes no time going to the oil town, oil rich town, little Boston, with... Uh, H.W., where they ostensibly arrive to do some quail hunting. Plainview finds the barren Sunday farm and meets Paul's father, Abel, who is so poor he cannot afford to offer Plainview and his son bread. While setting up camp near their home, Plainview and H.W. are greeted by a man who introduces himself as Eli, Paul's brother. So Paul Dano plays two characters in the movie. Um, this is somewhat perplexing as Eli appears to be the same young man who had previously introduced himself as Paul, but they're twins. Uh... Their cynicism shows us parallels between Plainview and Nietzsche. Nietzsche, whose father uh, was a Lutheran pastor, at, um, let's see, I thought we would do better to study the motives that drive philosophers and preachers to their particular moral conclusions than to concern, them, concern ourselves with their truth. Nietzsche thought that like everything else, philosophy and religion were expressions of self-interest, which is what Eli embodies in the film. Plainview does not even entertain the possibility that Eli's desire might be motivated, no, motivated by anything other than his will to power. Um, there's no question in Plainview's mind that Eli uses religion merely to rationalize his motives and dispositions, and he's right in that in terms of the film. Um, also, there's uh, he talks about scaffolding and the hierarchies that exist in society, and then finally, uh, and and the scaffolding you know that occurs in the film. And how the boy is thrown from the scaffolding, right? And he's thrown down, deaf. Um, democratic decadence and corruption. Um, also, there's the Church of the Third Revelation, yeah, which I thought of. I thought of Grif of Grimsby. All right, this is the part I wanted to read. Really, this is called De Profundis. Plainview himself is a man who's emerged from the depths of the earth. We saw him injured in the opening sequence. While digging in a deep hole, we've seen his filthy hands and face covered in dirt and oil, and we know that his power comes from the same source. The metaphor is one of evolution, of man, the species who has emerged from dust, from lower forms of life, who has survived through his adaptation and overcoming of adversity. Um, Sunday is a soft, solicitous fellow who, in Nietzschean terms, is unfit for survival. Um, 
It elevates what is ignoble, making it an object of praise while stigmatizing the manly virtues, labeling them sins in terms of the Nietzschean worldview um, and how he's, uh, he, how he's seen um, through Plainview. Indeed, Sunday attempts to do this by trying to make Plainview ashamed of the very character traits, independence, will, ambition, fearlessness, strength, decisiveness that make the viewer admire him, but Plain, Plainview feels no moral guilt. I mean, really, he has no moral guilt in this. Um, and let's see, uh, we see him say the thing about blood. The, the oil pipeline is likened to a vein supplying the, the lifeblood of the individual revolution and powering a whole planet towards prosperity. That's why it's a kind of American trilogy. And there's the final scene of the ritual humiliation with Eli and, um, Plain view. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to read was um, something about the guy that this is based on. This is from the book Oil here, or the I'm sorry, it's called The Prize, the Epic Quest for Oil, Money, and Power. And this talks about the guy that Plain View is based on, and that is a guy named Edward Do oh, oh, Edward Doheny Edward Dockney, I guess Edward Doheny Edward Dockney says, uh, and it was tied up with the Teapot Dome scandal. Um, he also leased the more bountiful California Reserve Elk Hill to Edward Dockney. Both were among the best, the best known of American oil men. They were entrepreneurs, new men who had risen up on their own abilities to create major enterprises outside the old standard oil inheritance, which occurs in the movie. Dockney was something of a legend. He had begun his career as a prospector, silver, silver miner. Laid up when he broke both legs falling down a mine shaft, he had put the time to good use by studying to become a lawyer, which is different from the film, obviously. He also was also said to have fought off a mountain lion with a knife. By the 1920s, he had amassed a vast fortune, and his company, Pan American, was actually a larger crude oil producer than any of Standard Oil's successor companies. He himself scrupulously made a point to patronize and befriend politicians of both parties. Interesting. Interesting. You see how this is tied in with the American experience and globalism. Um, let's see. Um, uh, on January twenty fourth, nineteen twenty four, Edward Doheny Dockney, I don't know how you say his name, told the Senate committee that he had provided the one hundred thousand dollars to Fall, which his son had personally carried in cash, H H W, in a little black bag to Fall's office. No, it was not a bribe. Definitely not. He insisted just a loan to an old friend. They had prospected together for gold decades earlier. He even produced a mutilated note supposedly signed by Fall, though his signature had been ripped off. He explained that his wife held the signature portion so as not to embarrass Fall with the demand for an inconvenient repayment should he happen to die. It was friendship compounded with thoughtfulness. Hmm, interesting. Um, and then uh, in the Teapot Dome scandal, it says... Um, a vote of public confidence. He was judged innocent and never went to jail, leading one senator to complain, you can't convict a million dollars in the United States. Ooh. Uh, then this talks about, then it goes into talking about John D. Rockefeller and his origins. It's a pretty good book. Um, Henry Dougherty was an anomaly in the oil business. This guy knew him. Um, and he says, Doherty had begun working life at the age of nine, selling newspapers in the streets of Columbus, Ohio. He dropped out of school where he was 12. I had not been in school more than 10 days before I grew to hate school worse than Satan, he says. Um, and then he was later described as a diabolical needler of oil men. And then we also get uh, later on, or World War One, oil. Um, if oil was power, it was also a symbol of sovereignty. The Pan American Petroleum Corporation by Edward Dockney is one of the two dominating companies. That's Daniel Plainview's um, company. Uh, we get. Let's see, before World War One, World War One, we get leading up to World War One. The British minister to Caracas was more blunt. He described Gomez as an absolute monarch of the most medieval sense of the word, 
whatever the state of his literacy, Gomez knew what he wanted, which in addition to absolute political power was vast wealth. His poor country needed revenues if it was to, ve to develop economically and if he was to become rich. The two objectives blended as one. Revenues meant foreign capital. Oil was Gomez's opportunity, but he shrewdly recognized that in order to lure foreign investors, he would have to guarantee a stable and political fiscal environment. This is the beginning of the petrodollar in the oil wars of the 20th century and the way that the United States started to develop, started to develop client states and then leading into OSS, CIA, and the oil wars of the latter 20th century. Um, this says, in the 1920s, most of the production was directly or indirectly accounted for by just three, Royal Dutch, Shell, and Golf, and Pan American. Royal Dutch, Shell, Golf, and Pan American. The last was Edward Doheny's company, which still remained one of the most dominant producers in Mexico. In 1925, Pan American was purchased by Standard of Indiana. So eventually it's purchased by Standard Oil. Um, and then uh, the next chapter of this book talks about the Rothschild's oil interests in Russia and Lord Curzon, et cetera. This is a good book if you're wondering about oil um, because it's completely comprehensive. It talks about Rommel, uh, World War II. It talks about all the World War I deals. There's Kim Philby. Um, and when he went to um, Iran or went to the Middle East um, and – we also have, I mean, we've got, it, it, it's a pretty good book. Um, talks about tanks and, and uh, bullets and how they use oil in terms of mechanized industry. So, so anyway, that's about it, you guys. Um, that is There Will Be Blood, The Master, and Magnolia. Three films that I think perfectly illustrate a kind of American trilogy. And as far as the filmmaking goes, I mean, this is great filmmaking. You know, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson is one of the great filmmakers alive. And I think that, you know, it's interesting because I think probably his, his most powerful film is Magnolia. And it's interesting that he made that movie because of the success of Boogie Nights. Now, we haven't covered Boogie Nights. And in fact, Boogie Nights is, is obviously a different kind of film and doesn't really fit into this genre um, in terms of the American trilogy. Um, you know, is a kind of a different kind of cultural film. Uh, you know, probably deserves an analysis of its own from someone else. Um, but um, but these films are of a more generalized, you know, uh, American experience uh, dealing with, um, you know, geopolitics, will, um, and, and a kind of a resolution. So we have the beginning of the century, the middle of the century, and the end of the century. And there, there's no shortage of material and analysis of these films. I mean, like I was saying with Paul Thomas Anderson being a kind of Kubrick, I mean, that's one thing that immediately strikes you is as, as soon as you start to read into this stuff, you notice that, you know, like, it's just, there's so much, there's so much analysis. There's so much symbolism in each of these things. And, um, I watched nine hours of films and I don't know how many hours I spent just reading. Uh, not even just these. I mean, this is just, this is just like a couple of days worth of getting stuff off the internet to read about this. Um, you could sort of do endless uh, explication of these three films. And I think that it's important to do such things. So, so that's about it for those films. Um, I think he, everybody should watch those. I think they're great. And um, let's look and see if, about the Super Chats and see if anything else came in. You guys, don't forget that tomorrow night I will be on with um, Rachel, Base Homeschool Mom, on her channel, Rachel at Base Homeschool Mom. Rachel Wilson will be covering uh, music lyrics and witchy breakup songs. That one's going to be more fun. It'll be good also to be with her because uh, we're, we're good friends. and. Rachel's one of my good friends, and I hope to have a uh, lively conversation with her about music, which we haven't done in a long time. Um, you know, we did 
we we did lots of films. I mean, lots of music early on. Um, we haven't done any for about six months in terms of music analysis. But you can go back and watch my go back and watch my um, my Led Zeppelin analysis. We talked about, of course, we talked about um, Hasher and Metallica last week uh, with our friend Hasher. And I did the Metallica stream on uh, Johnny uh, Johnny Got His Gun by Trumbo about one, the song one. Uh, we've done Led Zeppelin. We've done, uh, we did Britpop. We did the Smiths. So tomorrow night, I hope we cover a bunch of stuff. We're probably going to be covering some Kate Bush. I hope to cover uh, Hounds of Love, L7, Bikini Kill, maybe some newer songs, Fleetwood Mac. Uh, all, I mean, all kinds. There's so much stuff out there to, to talk about. Also, I'll have my, I'll be on uh, Jamie's channel, Jamie Hanshaw, our friend Jamie's channel, in the first week of September covering Pan. That's going to be a big one. we got a lot to cover for that. We're going to be talking about all sorts of movies relating to Peter Pan and Pan, of course, with Aleister Crowley um, and his, remember uh, the eulogy at, at, at Crowley's funeral, The Great God Pan. Also, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath with Pan, Pan's Labyrinth, um, Horns, um, Peter Pan, there's like a million Peter Pan movies, so that one's going to be fun. And also, um, I've asked Jay if he wants to do uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau, and he said yes, so hopefully we'll do that, um, you know, the next, I don't know, sometime whenever he's free, he's busy. And that's a great one. I, I rewatched the film and uh, and reading the book, H.G. Wells, and that's great because, you know, the the it's about... <laughs> Human animal pig chimeras gestating on U.S. research farms. <laughs> no, it's about um, you know. Uh, Jay wrote a great essay on that, by the way. If you if you go to his um, website and you can look up, um, just just look up down into Dr. Moreau because he's got a great bit, a great essay on uh, Manhattan Project and scientism and transhumanism because that's what the book is about. So um, we'll be doing that. Also, we've got. So many of your sponsor streams um, to cover. So please don't don't stop sponsoring streams. Please continue to sponsor streams. Um, they help me out, of course. Um, they help me out to uh, keep the channel going. And also, if you want me to cover stuff, I haven't forgotten. I've, I've still got people from, like, back in March that I need to cover. I mean, I remember the Icelandic saga, or the sagas was one that came up in March. And time has flown by. I mean, you know, we're all busy. I've been really busy with stuff and with life. Um and stuff just keeps getting thrown thrown in, you know. So I haven't forgotten any of those. Thank you to everybody who's sponsored streams. Thank you to everybody who has uh, super chatted tonight. Really appreciate you. And um, let me look one more time at just these super chats on here. Again, uh, shouts out to Pure Blood Anglo Christian, five bucks. I appreciate you. Hey, appreciate you too, buddy. Um, and uh, shouts out to Circle G who dropped five bucks and had a biblical studies professor and he talked movies and he's excited for the stream. Hope I hope I did it some justice. Shouts out to let's see that was last time. Yeah, could, please continue to sponsor. I mean to help me out on these on the super chats because you know you don't get to you don't get to keep the <laughs> the super chats um, unless you make the uh, the threshold. So I got to make the threshold so that I can make money so I can, and then they hold it for a month. So I'm trying to make that for next month. That's not really y'all's concern, I know. But if you want to sponsor me on Super Chats, don't hesitate to do so, even though I do appreciate the immediate, um, the immediate um, uh, support there. And let's see. Let's look at our Super Chats for tonight. Sh shouts out again to our friend uh, Matty G out there who, um, Supporting me with a big fat super chat. Also, shouts out to John Connor who sent that twenty bucks for uh, "I'll Drink Your Milkshake," um, and to um, Andrea, tell me how to say your name, Andrea, or Andrea or Andrea, Andrea, ten bucks on PayPal. Um, let's see. Shouts out to Adam out there for that seven seven seventy seven. Yeah, he dropped seven seventy seven. And let's see, we got one from Jason too. Uh, I don't know where that one went. And if I uh, if I forget or if I if I don't get to your um, super chat, then I will definitely get to it next time. So thank you guys. Please um, make sure that you like the stream, share the stream, share my streams out. Go back and watch my old streams. You know, streams are getting. You can tell with every other channel too that you know they want shorts, right? 
they want shorts, but that's not what we do here. We do long, long critical analysis. So, um, you know, that's what we do. We're going to keep doing that. And, and the views can kind of go up and down. Barbie did well. Let's see. Bar Barbie did well. Um, my analysis with uh, Chase, with our friend Chase, did well. Right, we did uh, 21st Century Doom, 21st Century Love. Go back and watch my um, Jarhead analysis with my friend Grunt, because that was good. We covered Anthony Swafford and Jarhead. Um, Hasher, we covered um, we covered metal and various aspects of metal and the movie Hasher. Um, I covered Ronin and some 20th Century uh, French noir. Uh, the movie Ronin. Um, I did Love Games, Much Ado About Nothing. Go back and watch my uh, Thin Red Line. That's done pretty well. The Lost Generation, Hemingway, that's almost at 1,000. That's not bad. So we're going to get back into pure literary streams soon. Um, but, you know, we're doing streams with friends. We're doing movies. We're doing all kinds of things, and we're going into fall. And you know what I really want to do, just to end with this? What I really want to do is do a final girl analysis of horror movies for Sp Spooktober. So if you want to see that with Jamie and Jay, uh, let them know, because I think that would be fun. Um, we're going to do the final girl, the final girl archetype in, or trope, I guess, in uh, in 20th century horror slasher films, right? Maybe Camp Redwood, uh, American History X. That's the only season I've watched, because it has uh, Mr. Jingles. And it also has the scene, remember, it's got... Um, uh, Ramirez, the, the guy playing Ramirez, the Nightcrawler, and there's that scene where the woman, she goes, can you can you uh, turn down the music? It is too loud. And he goes, I do only place one way, full throttle. <laughs> and they're playing, flash for fantasy. She won't, oh, flash, flash for fantasy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we'll be covering all those. And, and uh, listen to the song Final Girl by Electric Youth. You may know them from the Drive soundtrack, if you know Electric Youth. That's a good synth, synth pop band. So I'll be covering all that. I got a bunch of, bunch of books to cover. Oh, I'll be doing Hunger Games, uh, the book and the film coming up soon. Of course, the Decameron, um, Icelandic Sagas, Pioneers of Pioneers, Walt Whitman. Um. What else? Uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, that and the terrible, terrible film that came out. I hate that movie. Um, and Yeah, but I think uh, Final Girl will be doing, uh, it'd be good to do all the Friday of uh, Friday the 13th movies um, because that would be cool. Okay. I, in fact, I, I'm not sure if, you know, that's one that, um, you know, we need to go back and look at. So we need to go look at those films. And so, and also Barbarian. Did you guys see Barbarian? That's another final girl. So uh, maybe we'll do that. Is the movie X? That movie X came out last year. I think that's got a final girl. I mean, it's a horror trope. So it'd be interesting to cover this. All right. So again, if you watch this and uh, the audio sounded different, I'm trying to get my audio correct. And um, again, one more time, thanks to Grunt out there, my good friend who supported me um, by sending me this awesome, awesome audio equipment. This is really a big help. I mean, it's, it really is. I just need to get the levels correct so I can sound like all of our other friends out there who sound so good and uh, get it all set up. Shouts out to Rachel. We will be there. Yes. So what's up, Rachel? We'll be there tomorrow night. Over on Rachel's channel, Based Homeschool Mom, covering um, music lyrics and witchy breakup songs. That's going to be a lot of fun. And shouts out to uh, Digital Minefield out there. And so, again, please leave a comment. Please make sure you smash that like. Um, you can support me anytime. Go to my channel description, my video descriptions. You can uh, send me PayPal's, Cash Apps, Venmo's, Super Chats, Donor Chats. And you can uh, write me emails at madmaximalism with two X's at gmail.com. And thanks to everybody. I've gotten a y'all. I've gotten a lot of really. I get a lot of really nice mail um, from people. Uh, really, you know, kind words and deep things that they send to me. A couple of things, you know, that I've gotten. I get I get something uh, a few times a week from people. So uh, that are reaching out. So I really appreciate that. And uh, also one more thing. Um, you can catch me on Boiler Room. I think we, we may be doing Thursday. I don't know. Um, you know, it's uh, it's. It's 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 them, so it's it's up to them, you know. Um, but uh, obviously, 
Again, this uh, whole stream uh, goes out to Chopper out there, dedicated to Chopper in his memory. God bless him. Uh, rest in peace from Boiler Room. And uh, shouts out to my friends on Boiler Room. I pray for them, and I pray for them in their grief. And I love them. They're, they are great. Uh, they've been extremely helpful to me, and they're, they're kind people. So shouts out to uh, Spore and Ruckus and Grunt and Hasher and all of them over there. Um, and they're great. So uh, please catch me on Boiler Room Thursday if we have it. Um, and that's about it, you guys. Thanks. And to play us out, we do it live here. So to play us out, here's uh, Rooks G and a cut off his new album. No, this is from Rooks G's Omega X. This is his brand new single. Please go to Rooks G and check out his breaks, his drum and bass. That's our homeboy out there. Rooks G, R-O-X-G. He makes great music. Please support him. Subscribe to his channel and like him. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate y'all. Hope you like this Paul Thomas Anderson. Peace. That's what I got. Peace. Let's go. Oh, she goes hard. Oh.